Welcome everyone. I call the June 14th, 2022 regular city council meeting to order. I now invite council member Zorns to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, everybody else, please mute your microphones and turn off your video while we just. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member Zorns. Before we move on to the agenda items, I'd like to acknowledge our remote meeting format. The City of Bothell's proclamation of extension of local emergency is in effect, therefore this meeting will be held entirely remotely. Public comment will be allowed both in writing or verbally. Sign up sheets were provided by the City Clerk's Office via link from the agenda. The video of this meeting will be streamed live as well as recorded and available for later viewing on the city's YouTube channel. A call-in number was provided on the meeting agenda for members of the public who wish to call in by phone to listen live to the meeting. If you have called in, we ask that you mute your device so as not to interfere with the meeting. If a participant fails to mute their connection and causes a disruption to the meeting, the connection will be terminated. For our phone-in callers during staff presentations, staff will make every effort to specify which materials they're referencing so everyone can follow along. At this point, we will take a moment to take roll call of the council members by position number. Please say here when the city clerk calls your name. City clerk. Council Member Zorns. Here. Mayor Thompson. Here. Council Member Alderks. Here. Council Member Alderks, I didn't hear that. Here. Can you hear me? No. Barely. 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 What? Yeah, but you're here. I'll work on okay. it. <laughs> council Member McNeil. Here. Councilor Mangi? Here. Deputy Mayor Alcabra? Here. All present. Thank you, City Clerk. Next, I'd like to reiterate some meeting guidelines. For all meeting attendees, please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking. Mute your microphone when not speaking. If you're also streaming the live video feed, please turn the sound off as there is a delay. For Council, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom or your yellow card when you wish to speak, and I will call on you. Speak clearly and pause frequently. And remember to mute your mic when not speaking. The first item on the agenda is meeting agenda approval. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? All right, seeing none, um, we will move on to public engagement opportunities. We have Pollinator Week coming up June 20th through 26th. This is like last week's meeting already. You can learn all about pollinators and take our pollinator pop quiz for a free packet of bee-friendly seed mix and a chance to win an insect hotel. You can see more at bothellwa.gov slash pollinators. We have the 4th of July parade and pancake breakfast on the 4th of July. Um, you can join us for uh, our hometown celebration, beginning with free pancakes at the park at Bothell Landing, followed by the downtown children's parade and the grand parade. And that's at bothellwa.gov slash 4th of July, spelled out F-O-U-R-T-H. And then we have Summer Nights in Bothell. Our new family-friendly six-week event series is coming to downtown Bothell this July. Um, enjoy music, art, and culture every Friday night. That's bothellwa.gov slash summer nights. All right. And moving on, we have a proclamation for Juneteenth. And Council Member McNeil um, has graciously agreed to read the proclamation into the record. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the, the opportunity to read this special proclamation. Um, whereas at 2 o'clock p.m. on New Year's Day, January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, providing that all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state shall then be thenceforward and forever free. And whereas on June 19th, June 19th, 1865, the last group of enslaved people were informed of their liberation in Texas, two and a half years after the implementation of the Emancipation Proclamation. And whereas, in order that we may never forget the evils of slavery and its aftermath, we must acknowledge the injustices and suffering of those experienced under slavery. And whereas Juneteenth celebrates the past, the present, and future achievements, contributions of Black and American African, African Americans to our communities and our country. And whereas we recognize the significance of Juneteenth and the importance in continuing to engage in dialogue on race relations to promote racial healing, reconciliation, and justice, 
And whereas during Juneteenth event, we appreciate the Black and African-American experience and celebrate the inclusion of all races, ethnicities, and nationalities as we commit to working together towards an equitable experience and opportunities for all those in our community. Now, therefore, I, James McNeil, on behalf of the Mayor Mason Thompson, the City of Bothell, do by hereby proclaim June 19th, 2022, to be Juneteenth in the City of Bothell, to recognize the painful origins of this day and to promote, he promote healing and unity. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member McNeil. Um, and I believe we have Dave Hayward here to accept. Mr. Hayward, can you hear us? You're, you're muted. Yeah, I, I can hear you. I can hear you. Great. Um, if you'd like to say a few words, please go ahead. <laughs> Uh, no, I have nothing to say. I appreciate it. I know the struggle we've been through to get to this point, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. Well, we're happy to have you be part of it as well, Mr. Hayward. Thank you for coming to accept the proclamation. You're welcome. All right. Next, we have a proclamation for International Widows Day. I just leave it. Whereas the city of Bothell benefits greatly from organizations that offer support to women of all ages, faiths, and Probably. backgrounds who are seeking comfort during times of grief after the loss of a significant other. And whereas the Modern Widows Club was founded in 2011 as a non-denominational organization that provides widow mentoring, leadership, and empowerment through member services, active social media sites, and an inspirational blog. And whereas in 2010, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution to annually observe International Widows Day on June 23rd to give special recognition to the situation of widows of all ages and across religions and cultures. And whereas on June 23rd, 2022, the Modern Widows Club of the Bothell area will observe International Widows Day to honor our local community of widows. That now, therefore, I, Mason Thompson, mayor of the city of Bothell, do hereby proclaim June 23rd, 2022 to be International Widows Day in the city of Bothell, and I encourage all to join me in raising awareness of the need for advocacy, mentoring, and leadership for women in widowhood. And I believe we have Cynthia Toledo here to accept. Oh, you're muted, Cynthia. Cindy? Cindy? There we go. Thank you so much. I'm honored and uh, very appreciate, appreciative of your recognition of International Widows Day. We do have a local chapter here in our area and serve about uh, 80 to 100 widows at this time. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Dr. Eric Murray from Cascadia here to give us a state of the college. Mayor Thompson, he's actually not in the in the room yet, and I have right. not received an email from him that he can't be here, so he may just be late. I can let you know if he joins. Well, do we have Chair Kiernan in the room, and can we do that? And if Dr. Murray um, arrives, we can we can do that then. Certainly. Give me just a second here. Oh, shoot. I moved here. Okay. Oh. Hi, Kevin. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for... Um, making time for me tonight on the agenda. I'm here on behalf of the Planning Commission. As I believe you're all aware, the commission has spent a considerable amount of time talking about uh, middle housing and housing affordability issues. And at our last meeting, we got the good news that the one member of the commission who was a renter is now an owner, but that led us to understand we have no renters on the Planning Commission. And Renters are a voice that we believe should be heard. So after some considerable discussion, 
the the commission drafted this letter, and um, I believe it's been sent to all of you, but I'd like to read it into the record. Mayor Thompson and members of the city council, the Imagine Bothell comprehensive plan shapes our city through the use of development regulations, public capital improvements, and special programs. The plan is amended periodically and is guided by input from city council, staff, boards, and commissions, and Bothell residents. The comprehensive plan creates a vision to steer development and improvements for a generation. This is a long-term policy document with heavy implications on how and where we live in Bothell. The Planning Commission asks that the Council adopt measures to encourage participation of renters and other underrepresented groups in the coming periodic update of our comprehensive plan. The Planning Commission is concerned that traditional methods of public engagement provide outside influence to homeowners and those members of the public most likely to have time and economic freedom to track and engage on public policy. The comprehensive plan guides the direction of Bothell for all, not just the voices traditionally lifted by our engagement processes. We encourage council members to consider measures to bridge the gaps in community engagement with historically underrepresented groups. These measures may include engaging in targeted outreach to include underrepresented groups and collecting demographic data from respondents to proportionally weigh comments and feedback provided by different groups. Additional measures should be employed to intentionally engage renter and other communities and to ensure the language used in city outreach reduces bias where possible respectfully, the Bo City of Bothell Planning Commission. Uh, subsequent to us uh, drafting this uh, letter, we received a survey from the middle housing event and 7% of the respondents were renters to that, significantly underrepresented as the percentage of population they are, further uh, emphasizing the point we make. So we want to bring this to your attention. We appreciate your consideration of this matter and uh, answer any questions you might have regarding it. Council Member Zorns. Uh, yeah, just a, just a quick question because I know um, if any uh, demographic is gonna be quite mobile, it's the renter population within. And so, you know, the question's always made, how invested are they in the community that they're in um, because of um, the long term, they, they don't have a tend to not have, if anyone's going to have a, not have a long term stay in a particular area, it's renters and for a lot of different reasons. Um, and did you talk about how to identify people who've been renting in Bothell for a long time? We you didn't know, talk, no, excuse me. No, no, no. Just because those are the those are the folks who are, I feel, are invested in in Bothell um, because they call it home, but they're busy paying rent to call it home. So it, it, it would I would really like to hear those voices most of all. Well, we really didn't uh, distinguish amongst the renters. You know, all the renters who are residents and citizens are voters in Bothell and they have a voice. I, I can speak to my previous life uh, in the solid waste division, and I tell you, recycling in multifamily housing is very difficult because uh -huh. it is a difficult community to get to. Right. Uh, it is a challenge, but I think we should recognize that challenge and, and try to address it. Um, again, the, the recent survey, 7% of the respondents were renters in the middle housing survey. Well, and, uh, that seems very low, given the percentage of renters there are in the city. Oh, I agree. And it's not just multifamily. They're renting homes and duplexes as well. And um, I guess we can make a case if it's seven percent, beggars can't be choosers. Any renters we can get to the table to speak, regardless of how long they plan on living in Bothell, it would be good to hear them with such sure. a low, low involvement. Thank sure. you. And, and the concern would be with, with that low a percentage, though, their voice, uh, that their voice be weighed uh, appropriately. Right, right, right. Well, thank you for, for bringing this to us. And I hope uh, Planning Commission is um, recovering from the trauma of Nathan Lamb leaving our, <laughs> leaving us at some point. I, I think you popped uh, news on us that we were going to be told during the meeting tomorrow night. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, work on your your appreciatory, appreciative goodbyes because we're get, Bothell's going to miss him not being part of Bothell here. Yes, I think we will. He's he's been a, 
a delight to work with and uh, that's oh unfortunate. Goodness. Right, right. No, I agree. All right, I'm gonna let anyone else chime in who might might want to uh, ask something or have a comment. Councilmember Aldricks. Thank you, Chair, for being here and um, and for reading this letter tonight. Um, I was really appreciate uh, appreciative of seeing it in my inbox when you sent it out to Council, and. Um, I think this might actually be more of a question for our um, assistant city manager. So Becky, if you're listening, um, how, you know, what are, what are the ways, what are the resources that we have available to us to outreach to this group of Bothell residents? And, um, and, you know, I, I, I hear the urging loud and clear um, and and appreciate some of the suggestions, but I'd very much like to, uh, I guess, also hear from staff about how we can action on this recommendation. And so if you have any thoughts too, uh, Chair Kiernan, please share. Erin, I'm happy to answer that if you're okay with that. Yeah, um, staff, we always really value uh, broad and inclusive community engagement. And actually staff really likes doing community engagement and reaching out to folks that we don't typically hear from or that are too busy to log in or come to a council meeting. Um, and we can put together a broad, inclusive community engagement plan. It does just take some resources and a little bit of time. Um, I will say right now that, you know, we don't have um, probably all, we're not very deep in that set of resources for communications and community engagement. But if that's council's desire that we deliver more in that area, we can absolutely put together a strategy and some uh, requests for resources to help you with that. I would just add on that um, I believe as part of the budget process, council will be hearing from staff about needs associated with the comprehensive plan periodic update in particular, and that would include uh, communications and, and other, other resource needs. So just adding on to what this interim assistant city manager added. All right, well, I don't see any more questions. Um, I would just add that I think that this conversation will probably dovetail nicely with another conversation that's on our agenda a little later tonight when it comes to outreach and meeting underrepresented populations. Um, so we, we probably aren't quite done with this whole conversation tonight. But Chair Cannon, thank you very much for the letter. It's very appreciated and thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Good night. Good night. Mayor Thompson. Um... Dr. Murray's running a little bit late, so maybe we could skip forward to um, the special event update with sure. Blaine. Um, let's do that. I believe we have Blaine Land here to um, come talk to us about the fun stuff. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council members. It is my pleasure to give you guys an update of the Summer Nights and Bothell event series. Just make sure you guys can hear me okay. All good. Awesome. So the last time we got to meet, it was, gosh, what, April, and we were in the fundamental stages of figuring out the core components of what Summer Nights in Bothell could truly be. Um, and having that, I joined this amazing Parks and Recs team in March. We have made some great way in collaborating with stakeholders, um, food vendors, artists, um, and I get to share a little bit and pieces of overview, not give it all away, but I get to share, share a little bit to you all. So I'm going to share my screen to give you guys a presentation. We're in a walk week by week, just so you can see the series of events that we have planned for you. So one moment. Right. Can everybody see my screen? Mayor Thompson, are you able to yeah. see? Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, perfect. So I'm going to give a high level overview of the Summer Nights um, event series, Music, Art and Culture. For those who are new to the call and haven't heard about Summer Nights in, in Bothell, I highly encourage checking out our webpage um, through the Parks and Recreation website. Um, this has been a culmination of great effort through the city council along with community stakeholders to reignite and activate downtown um, Bothell with special events. And so today I get to give a high level overview of the six weeks that we have planned thus far and open up for questions and comments at the end. 
Um, so we're going to go through week one. Um, it is important to note that this is music, art, and culture, as prefaced before. And each week is uniquely different. So week one is music night. On this slide, you will see that it will start on July 15th. We are bringing Harmonious Funk, a live band, to the um, Bothell City Hall. In addition to a live band, there will be three to four food trucks. There will be large giant games, outdoor seatings, and ambiance to carry on what is a resemblance of concert in the parks, but down in the heart of our community at City Hall. Week two is going to be an immersive art night. We are working with, or I am working with, the Bothell Art Commission to select performing artists, visual artists, crafters, and makers, buskers in addition, to create an immersive art night downtown Bothell on Main Street. Um, art night will be on July 22nd, the following Friday. There will be three to four um, live performers. I am excited that we have confirmed three live performers thus far. We have 10 local artists, and it's an array of fine art, decorative art, craft, interactive activities. In addition to that, we have visual artists. We have some artists that will be playing um, music and creating a canvas. We also have artists that will be hosting an art class, just an immersive experience. Um, later on in this presentation, I will get to showcase how we are working with a local artist here in Bothell who will be creating a selfie art installation that will carry on through all six weeks. It will be our, what I call, as many events have the, uh, the winged background as a selfie art installation for Instagram and Facebook. We will have a unique one for Summer Nights in Bothell. And lastly, but not least, we'll have live demos and activities for all ages at the Immersive Art Night. Week three is a cultural night, a cultural celebration back at the City Hall. Um, on July 29th, we are partnering with Central Cultural Mexicano. It is imperative that in the idea and concept to do cultural nights that we found trusted partners. And Central Cultural Mexicano is a trusted partner within the community and surrounding areas. We are working together to have live music, dancers, performers. In addition, there'll be art installations provided by Central Cultural Mexicano folk art vendors, outdoor seating, and an array of activities. Week four, and we're back to music night. As I uh, um, mentioned at the beginning, we are doing music, art, culture. It's a three-week event series cycled through twice. So on week four, we're back to music night. August 5th, Bothell City Hall, we have booked the West Coast Feed, a creative band. Um, this will be a very interactive evening, again, with food trucks, giant outdoor games, outdoor seatings, and yes, those ambient lightings that will be coming out on the City Hall Plaza. Week five is again an immersive art night. It is important that I note that each art night has different artists, different performers. So every night is a taste of something different. Um, the week five art night, we have five live performers. We have buskers coming. Um, we have visual artists coming, um, a different selection of artists for this particular night. Um, and then again, the live demos and activities. It's important to, as I take a pause right here, is this six week event series, it is crucial that we market properly to our audiences of residents of Bothell and beyond of how each week is located potentially in a different spot. And that's what you see on this slide is mirroring what we're doing in a marketing landscape of highlighting the date, the location and who we're partnering with. And then week six, week six is August 19th. We are partnering with Utsav, NASAA, and Beats of Redmond to create an amazing outdoor experience with dancing, um, dance performances, celebration ceremony, food vendors, craft vendors. Um, it will be an absolute joy um, to cap the six weeks of entertainment. In a nutshell, that's what we have for the six weeks. There's tons of activities and I think it's an immersive experience that everybody should come out to enjoy. I did wanna highlight our marketing. Since we last um, spoke, it's relatively all the same with a little bit of pop of color. This is the poster that we have had printed. Um, I personally love this poster. What was important to us is that when we were creating the poster, we wanted to create some color, um, some context that each week there is something different. As you can see, we have icons for music, art, and culture. Um, and this poster does highlight all six weeks. I have created a community contact list. I have already reached out to the businesses on Main Street, 183rd, and on Bothelway Northeast. I'm still collecting data for more businesses, but I have done a first push of saying this is coming to downtown. Um, we are actually going to be putting these um, posters out later this week. Um, in addition 
addition to that, all of our power partners in play, such as the Chamber of Commerce, have been in communication to add this to their calendars. And there will be more marketing materials to spread the awareness of the six weeks of entertainment. I do want to kind of reiterate the marketing platforms for anybody that's on this call. As we as the city of Bothell, we are the Parks and Recreation. We have Facebook, Instagram, and we are utilizing our local businesses and stakeholders to share um, for the community outreach aspect. Our cultural organizations do have an authentic language and authentic tone, and they will be utilizing their platforms in addition to radio, newspaper, Facebook, so on and so forth. So I thought it was be imperative that anybody on this call just knows that Summer Nights in Bothell is on our main um, City of Bothell website, um, and all weeks are highlighted within the Parks and Recreation webpage. I do want to take a moment to just recognize our partners. Um, it is a great deal to put on six weeks that are very uniquely different from renting equipment to, you know, AVR and sound and our road closures, um, utilizing many different departments internally and then a lot of external stakeholders. So I sincerely appreciate anybody that has been on a committee, been on a meeting with me, has met with me down at the city hall um, to make this series of events really come to fruition. I did want to highlight, um, just to give you a snippet of the local artists that we are going to be utilizing. Um, this is a cool just imagery of what is going to be made for our selfie art installation. Um, what came to my attention is that uniquely different in um, communities, there is a photo opportunity that creates some, some, some sort of memorabilia. And this local artist, Hannah, um, I reached out to her and I said, I would love to create almost a frame just to capture Bothell and our, our attendees. This is just a mock of the design. It will actually be six feet tall. Um, and Hannah is hard at work at creating this selfie art installation that will be at all six weeks. And I just thought it would be something uniquely different. In addition, we will have, you know, marketing and swag and info, um, info booths. But I wanted to give a little teaser of to what um, elements, extra elements will be at our Summer Nights in Bothell. That does wrap up my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing and open it up for questions. Um, I did stop sharing. I haven't seen everybody. Councilmember Zorns, I believe, has her hand up. All right. So not so much a question. I am just giddy with <laughs> anticipation. Um, and as a photographer, oh my goodness, I love the the our selfie opportunity. Um, I do have to tell you, and I hope it's okay because I substitute yeah. in the North Shore School District. I've been telling kids and staff about what's coming up in Bothell. There's, they didn't know about it. Um, and they're very uh -huh. excited. A number of people are excited about Utsav and uh, Cultural Mexicano. Do I have that group right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Very, very excited for it. So um, I'm hoping that we'll see a lot of our younger generations with their families down there enjoying it as well. And thank you, Blaine. Yes. You, are, you are a rock star. And um, oh, I, I it. just really appreciate everything you've poured into in just a brief amount of time on this. Thank you. Council Member Aldricks. Hi, Blaine. Thanks so much for this presentation. Looks great. And um, I can just see how how just how well you took kind of all of the thoughts and ideas that people shared with you and, and put it in there. Um, the, fa the fact that there are the inflatable play uh, equipment that's coming in, that's really exciting um, for kids. Thank you for including that. Um, and I'm also going to, I'm not trying to put more work on you, I promise. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that um, event planning is hard for one event, but you just planned six events, like back to back to back. Um, and that's amazing. Um, and I'm, it's going to be very cool. I'm really excited for it. But um, I'm thinking about, um, is there a way to have like quiet spaces set up for people who are neurodivergent who may get overwhelmed in loud spaces? I'm thinking more about like our autism population and some of the kids in our community and maybe you've already thought through it. And so if you have, I'd love to hear about it, but um, yeah, that's, that's just one thing that came to mind uh, watching your presentation, especially since mu live music can be loud. Mm -hmm. 
No, I sincerely appreciate that insight and perspective. I think there is opportunity to have that. Um, we have the grass lawn area. And then if you're thinking of the, I, I always get to mix up West and East Plaza, but the plaza too um, that has the bistro lights hanging currently, that would be a great safe space for our sound. Um, and, but I definitely, I will take that into consideration and make some signage just to bring that to attention. Um, I appreciate that. All right. I don't see any more hands. Um, Blaine, we're so excited for this. Thank you. I'm I'm really, really pumped just to be able to get out and enjoy these after talking about them and um, getting them going. So thank you for all the work you've done. I'm really excited to see how this is all coming together. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right. Mayor Thompson, uh, yes. Dr. Murray is here. Fantastic. Yep. Hello. Hey, Dr. Murray. Oh, but for a fleeting sorry, moment. Sorry, sorry, we had a little snafu. We're bringing them back. There he is. <laughs> You're is back. <laughs> I know I was late. Didn't mean you have to kick me off. <laughs> um, uh, Mayor Thompson, members of the council, hello, and uh, thanks for having me. Again, apologies for tardiness in my business. That doesn't go down very well. So um, there's a calendaring, calendaring error on, on our side. So um, am I good to go and start the presentation? You're good to go. And as it turns out, we had some other stuff to do in the meantime. So no harm, no foul. All right. Well, I'm going to bring up um, Robin, unless uh, you have it, I'm, I have um, my five PowerPoint slides that I can share. Well, um, Dr. Murray, I'm really sorry. We were not sent anything, so I Well, don't... you know what? I just happened to have it. And <laughs> can we, can everyone see my screen? There you go. All right. Um, so more than one difficulty tonight, but this is my occasional update on the state of the college. Uh, I come every so often to periodically update the city councils in our service district. And just as a reminder, not only do we love and are glad to be in the center of Bothell, but we serve the cities of Kenmore and Woodenville, Kirkland, Redmond, all the way out to Duval and Carnation. And so uh, it is my job to come and let you know how Cascadia is doing, and then we'll take some questions afterwards. Uh, we are doing fine. Um, we, during the pandemic, obviously our business was, uh, if, if you call education a business, was impacted like other folks. And uh, across the nation, about 40, no, I would say we're down about 40% in enrollment, but anywhere between 15 and 50%, uh, all of the community colleges in the state of Washington are down in enrollment and it's a nationwide trend. Uh, there are multiple reasons for that stemming to the pandemic and housing insecurities and financial insecurities and jobs and, and those kinds of things. But we are stable. And during the last couple of years, we've used that time to refine some things so that we're even better prepared to serve our community moving forward. So I want to tell you just about a few things that we're doing so that you're aware of them. And then we'll, we'll get into some uh, questions and answers. But we added some new academic programs and the state legislature just uh, this last session authorized us to start offering running start courses during the summer. That's never been allowed before. And so we are starting to get see a running start population uh, enroll with us. We have a new American Indian and Indigenous Studies program, uh, which is the first of its kind in the state. And we also were authorized by the legislature to start offering bachelor's of science degrees in computer science. The university system was obviously overwhelmed with the number of students that it needed to produce with that degree. And so we've been authorized to do that. So you'll see all of these things coming around this fall. Uh, we are opening a new satellite site in Redmond. You might be familiar with the Together Center, which is a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits. And they have affordable housing above uh, a space where 20 nonprofits will be. And we have a classroom right in the center of that so that we'll be able to serve the southern part of our district. 
We're implementing guided pathways, which was a, a new advising system that really helps break down barriers, especially for underserved and underrepresented students. And it's a whole new uh, cultural way of thinking about how we move through getting a degree. And it looks at meta majors uh, so that students have more flexibility to move from one major to the other. And we have a couple of customer relation management tools that we implemented for uh, technology improvements. Uh, my partner at UW Bothell, which uh, I'm sure you've crossed paths with her, has been the most outstanding thing to happen to Cascadia in the 12 years that I've been there. And we are building new pathways between Cascadia and UW. And as an example, any student who's not accepted as a freshman into UW, their name and is being given over to Cascadia so that we can contact them and have them start with us instead. And that kind of data sharing has never been done before. Um, for students applying as freshmen into UW Bothell, they have about a 25% chance of getting in. When you go to Cascadia first, you have about a 90% chance of getting in after two years. Many of you were there when we did our groundbreaking for our new science building built in conjunction with UW, first ever building in the nation where a community college and a university have come together to build a joint building where our faculty will teach under one roof and share offices side by side and our students will see that seamless pathway. We will also have, in a, as soon as the, the design and funding is all put together, but we've been approved for a new student services building, which we're calling CC5. And you are all, I'm sure, very aware of UW Bothell's new housing project, which will uh, house a thousand UW students. Although if they can't fill it, Cascadia students get the next option to uh, take advantage of that. We are ready for students to return. We, we are continuing to have some in-person classes, some hybrid classes, and some remote. We're trying to find the balance for what students want and serves them best, but we will definitely be have at least 60% of our classes in person. Uh, and for us in Basel, um, I mentioned parking because I think that will be, uh, with our new parking garage, I'm not sure we're going to see kind of the rollover into the, into the neighborhoods that we used to. We have our same staff and faculty. We did not lay off anyone during the pandemic. And that's a testament, I think, to Cascadia's financial stability. We had enough reserves to float our time. And even for the next two or three years, if enrollment doesn't return as robustly as we want, we have enough money to keep all of our folks employed so that we are ready for them to come back. All of our facilities are open and we are still the most successful transfer institution in the state. As many of you know, um, our institution is, let me get, let me do that button. Uh, our institution is focused on transfer education, getting students into university more so than like Lake Washington Tech, our sister institution, which focuses on vocational and, trans and uh, professional technical education. So uh, really happy to report that Cascadia is healthy. We are financially stable. Uh, we are open for students, although we are dealing with an enrollment issue that all of our colleges are dealing with. Uh, as just kind of an example, uh, uh, Lake Washington Tech during the course of the pandemic laid off 50, 5 zero people. Uh, we laid off none. Um, I was told last week at a statewide conference that about 25% of the community colleges in Washington, there are 34 of us, but about 25% have no reserves or backup money to help float them during this time, which means they'll be making even more cuts during the coming year to balance the budget. Uh, Cascadia sits in a place where we can probably last about three or four or five years uh, in this current state. So that'll give time for students to realize that coming back to higher ed is important. We have a lot of enrollment initiatives out there with the Redmond Center, with our UW Bothell partnership. Many of you know that we did, uh, we're hosting student of color conferences on our campus. About 200 students from the Bothell School District came to us for a social justice conference. Uh, that also happened for Lake Washington School District, Riverview School District, and Lake Stevens School District was so interested in this that they are sending students to us for their own conference of this type. And that really exposes students who have uh, not had the chance to understand what higher ed is. It exposes them to our campus and what those opportunities are. So we're doing fine. Uh, as always, we appreciate the support of the council and um, Aaron's been great. Mayor Thompson, you've been great. Uh, Rami, we've seen you on campus and that's been great. Jenny, you too. Um, I really do appreciate all of the support um, from all of you. I don't think our relationship with you has ever been probably as good as it is these days. So 
Um, with that, I'll conclude my presentation and, and happy to have a conversation or take questions if you have the time or desire. I believe the deputy mayor already has his hand up. Look at that. Three people with their hands up. Yay. Uh, always good to see you, uh, Dr. Murray, and uh, thank you for the update. And uh, one thing you allude, alluded to, uh, well, I want to first reiterate how lucky and like extremely lucky we are as a city to have uh, an edu uh, institution <clears throat> and two, you know, in our, like right in our backyard, uh, other cities would, you know, take extreme measures to have such, uh, <laughs> to, to be in such a situation. So thank you. Uh, I really have always appreciate having higher ed uh, institutions in, in my backyard. Makes it easier for my daughter to go up the hill, you know, and, <laughs> and attend. Uh, the question I have for you and what you alluded to is like, how can we, as a city government, I know enrollment is, you know, stay, you know, it's always better to have more enrollment, you know, uh, increase that enroll enrollment rates. How can we help you as a city I, to, to achieve that goal? I appreciate the question. Um, I know that Bothell has multiple identities. Um, we have this identity with some of our big corporations that house here. We have this, uh, this small town Main Street identity. We uh, have the Canyon Creek uh, identity. But we also, uh, I think, really embracing the idea that we are a college and university town. Um, not very many other cities out there um, it, when you have a 10,000 student institution in a city of 60 or 70,000, that's huge. And as you've alluded to, and I think somehow in our branding, uh, in what we do on our websites, in making sure that we continue to rotate the brand of UW and Cascadia through all of the things that the city does would help increase awareness. I, I think that's one strong point. The second strong point is that we have several high schools in Bothell um, that feed into us. And uh, as we look for a new school district superintendent, which I'm sure you're aware that, um, uh, that our um, former superintendent has taken a job in Virginia, um, I'll be involved in that search. But as long as the city can also keep forefront that our school districts and our higher ed should work seamlessly and that we expect that kind of relationship from our new school district superintendent. I think that would be a big show of support if the, if the city could keep reminding the school district of that as we go search for a new person. Um, to me, visibility and relationships continue to be probably the strongest things the city can do for us. Council member Aldrichs. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Dr. Murphy. So good to see you again. Um, I just want to take a moment to reiterate that um, some of the things that you're doing at Cascadia, you're not just leading in our region, you're not just leading at the state level, but you're also leading nat uh, nationally. Um, and that is just a testament to the good work of the staff that have all been there. The fact that everybody's been able to keep their job, financial solvency is huge. Um, I, I just... I am so um, pleased to hear this update. And you start you started the presentation with, we're doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and it just, that was such an excellent update. And I just thank you for it. Um, you know, don't undersell it. I, I maybe you need a cheerleader, I'll come and I'll, okay. I'll speak up a little bit. I, I'm about a it. perfectionist <laughs> when it comes to things. If I had a thousand more students and I wasn't having to dip into my reserves, things would be awesome. Um, but you're right. Um, I, I may have downplayed the the opening statement a little bit. We're we're doing just fine. Okay, so. awesome. Well, then, how what? And it, maybe you've already answered this question from the deputy mayor. Um, you know, you want a thousand more students. I, I do think that uh, building the relationship with the um, with this the school district um, and really making a seamless transition between our high schools and running start would make a big difference for the, for the university, um, or for the college there. I don't know if it would be a thousand students, but yeah. also, um, just being able to, um, help promote recruit, you know, get the word out that, that, um, Bothell not only is, has a really awesome main street that college students in our college town should come and visit, um, but that we can, we can, uh, bring people to, to our, to our area. And thank you for everything that you're doing and working with other school districts 
um, with those conferences, uh, bringing students as far as Lake Stevens is fantastic. So I'm, I'm just very pleased to hear this update. I think you should be very proud of the work that you're doing there. And, and I know that I am proud that um, Bothell has Cascadia here in our city. So thank you. Thank you. And just to, to be clear with the school district, um, they're in a bind. For every Running Start student they send to us, they lose that money that comes from the state and that money comes to us to pay for the tuition and the fees and all, and all of that. And so while every school district wants their students to gain more college credits at low cost as they can, it also costs them every time that they, that happens. And some school districts fully embrace running start and say, and say, we don't care about the cost. Other school districts tend to say, well, we can do other things like AP and IB and, and all of those things. My thought and what I really really want to encourage North Shore to think about is we need to give students options. Um, AP might not be the right option for a student, but Running Start might be. And so we need to give students and parents that choice um, rather than make the choice for them. Uh, so that, those are the messages I'll, I'll remind the school district of. Council Member Lawrence. Well, can I say that I enjoy putting the shoe on the foot where I get to ask the questions this time. <laughs> Because I think the last time we talked, you were grilling us. So. I think I was. <laughs> so at any rate, um, one uh, parent of five Running Start students. So, you know, and my oldest son was the first graduating class at Cascadia. And as you were talking about um, fine tuning that relationship between Cascadia and U of Dub Bothell, there was a lot of work that had to have been had to be done because my son went in thinking all his credits would just magically transfer to U of Deb Bothell and there was there was some miscommunication and it's and over time a lot of those uh, um, hiccups have been worked out and I've just been very grateful um, for the work that you've been doing. Um, a, a question about and when I'm in the schools, the high schools, I'm always pushing running start. You know, you. go go even running start half days, but it's a great way to it, it's like a scholarship. Take advantage of it. So um, running start in the summer. Here's here's uh, here's one of, I think, two questions running start in the summer. Do they still are they still limited to, limited to six quarters total for for this? Um, I don't think so. I, I think this is an ad. Um, oh, not 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 giving an op them an option to stagger their six quarters. Uh, I think I'm going to have to go back and check to be honest, but okay. I think it's, it can be continuous. I think you can start the the summer after your sophomore year and go continuously, including the following summer after junior year, and uh, to make it almost eight quarters. Yeah. But let me check on that. Okay. I mean, what what students may not realize is the best time to go to school is summer quarter. It's, it is a fantastic time to go to school. For sure. So um, I'm glad that that's open. Uh, and then just my other question was to um, how, you said there's a 90% chance, a 90% acceptance rate from Cascadia to U of Deb Bothell Correct. Where, versus when they just apply straight to U of Deb Bothell. I missed that number. 25%, that was okay. pre-pandemic. Oh, okay, that's what I got. So I, I, evidently I didn't miss it. Thank you very much. And I'm you. glad you've stuck with Cascadia for a dozen years. Is that what you said? A dozen years, and I hope for a dozen more. Good. Well, we'll hold to hold you to it. Thanks, Council Member Mankey. Thank you for the update, Dr. Murray. Um, excited to send my kids to Cascadia for running start in about ten years. So hoping you'll still be there when they. I, uh, I will hold a place for them for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just out of curiosity, with the decline in enrollment, um, I'm curious, are tuition prices changing at all? Are they reducing to try to draw folks back in? Uh, I know with everything that's going on right now, there's just a lot lot of uncertainty, and I'm just curious if if the demand, the lack of demand there has driven prices down at least at all, or if, if we've considered that um, to try to fill classrooms and bring start bringing people back in. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, just so you all know, the college doesn't set tuition, the state legislature sets tuition, um, and they actually are raising it by 3%. Um, 
in a, in a great business model, yeah, uh, reducing the prices might draw people back in. Two data points. Um, one is we also still have rising costs of salaries and negotiated contracts and labor unions and software licensing and all of that stuff. So our, like everyone else, inflation's hitting us as well. Uh, the um, other point I wanted to make with that, oh, our foundation, our, our nonprofit that generates money for scholarships, we had over $100,000 to give away over the course of this last year. And we made phone calls to all of our students who stepped out or were really close to finishing but didn't. Um, and out of those 800 phone calls, I think we were able to give money away to five people, um, literally just five, because money wasn't the issue for them. It was the fact that they wanted to hold on to their job. They didn't want to take time out from that. They didn't know what, where their kids were going to be. Um, they, I think folks are trying to hold on to a sense of stability right now. Um, and holding on to their dollars uh, so that if something goes bad, again, they're in a better place. Um, I really think that's what's motivating a lot of, of society right now. Um, but we don't set the tuition it's set for us, and so we have very little control. We are raising money, however, and um, some of you may know, but I am looking to build my foundation board. We, we restarted it uh, about a year and a half ago. I have seven board members trying to get to 15 so if you know of anyone who is interested in maybe helping the community college, um, look for folks, donors who want to, to help raise money for students and for programs, I would love to hear those names. Um, you can shoot me an email and we'll, we'll talk to them. Um, in fact, one of our foundation board members might be calling every one of you, we're giving them the list of all the city councils, uh, to say, hey, uh, Ben, who do you know who might be interested in doing this? So, so expect a call from one of our foundation members. Great. Well, thank you for the additional information. That it makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad to hear that Cascadia has done well to build that reserve so that you're not in the same situation as other colleges. That's excellent, excellent planning and management. So kudos to you and your staff for being in that position. Thank you. And, and thank you all. I'm really excited to continue working with you as we go through the next couple of years. Thank you, Mayor Thompson. Oh, oh I get a turn. I get a turn. Oh, oh, I didn't see your hand raised. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I don't have a lot. I just wanted to say thank you for coming. Um, and I'm really excited about the partnership between UW Bothell and Cascadia as a uh, Running Start student. Back in the day when if you graduated with an associate degree from Running Start, you automatically got into the UW. So like it was pretty easy for me back then. But hearing that 90% of people can do that, that's pretty exciting for a parent knowing that they you know, if they didn't get into UW Bothell right away, or if they wanted to do running start or something like that, like there can be that sort of stability for four years, regardless. Yeah. Um, and, and I appreciated your point about kind of embracing being a college town. And if we can, uh, if we can do that and provide places for folks to live, we could have a pretty attractive place for people to come for four years and get an education. And that's pretty exciting. Yeah. I think sometimes we get a little lost in the shadow of UW. Um, but I think it's important that we represent both sides of the house. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good meeting. Thanks. All right. Next up, I believe we have the interim city manager report. Interim city manager Linhart. Thank you, is this Mayor. Your, is this your is this your last one of these? Uh, well, I think in I will theory? probably I, in theory I will probably be introducing our new city manager at his first meeting. Um, but uh, yeah, this is my last one flying solo at the very least. So uh, thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, just a couple of items for you, uh, one a little bit shorter and easier than the other. Uh, the first is an update on our conversations with the boards and commissions about uh, hybrid and in-person meetings, um, and it's fairly universal amongst them that they are all comfortable with the idea of returning to um, a hybrid format where they can welcome the, the public back in um, if they would like to be in person. So um, with that information, as promised, I will turn it over to the council for discussion about what you would like to do going forward. So just as a reminder, the mayor has signed an emergency proclamation extending our uh, virtual format for all public meetings. So that's the city council and all boards and commissions uh, through the month of June at this point in time. So 
with that, I will turn it over to you for discussion. Not everybody all at once. Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm good with starting on the uh, first meeting of July, uh, a hybrid for those of us who wanna be at, you know, at the dais in, uh, you know, in person. Cause you know, for six months as the new guy, you know, it's not as exciting as being you know, there. So looking forward to it. Really, really sorry to hear about your six months, Deputy Mayor. Um, Councilman Rosones. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine uh, going hybrid uh, starting July. For me personally, I will be there and in person every, every Tuesday. Uh, and if we have hybrid option when the cold and flu season starts hitting, yeah, um, I may back, duck back into uh, being remote if we still have the hybrid format going on. But yeah, I'll be there in person in July if we can do that. Council Member McNeil. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I too will be there. I'm looking forward to be there in in July, and uh, I promised interim city manager I'd bring some barbecue for one of our first dinners back at City Hall. I'm excited to hear that. Councilmember Mangi. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, seeing that there's gonna be barbecue there, I will be there as well. Councilmember Alderks. If it's if it's Brother Hayward, right? It's gonna be hit. It's gonna be Carolina Smoke. I hope. Um, and I might I might be there. That might be enough to get me out of my my little cocoon here. Um, to Deputy Mayor's point, you know, we were elected to uh, City Council, and we got to you know this is the room where it happens here on the screen, um, but now we could go into the actual room where it actually happens. Um, and, and so I really do appreciate that we're maintaining the, the hybrid, um, option because I can very much gauge, you know, day of COVID rates, my exposure, you know, all of the details and factors, I think that we've all been taking into account over the last couple of years. Um, that flexibility is very appreciated. Um, and, and I know that my family will benefit from it. So, um, I am, I'm very pleased that we we'll have this option going forward. I'm looking forward to it. I hope to join you um, in person, but it will very much be a case by case, you know, Tuesday by Tuesday basis. So thank you. Yeah, I uh, echo uh, what Councilmember Alder said. I'm excited that we have the hybrid option. Um, cases are up, hospitalizations are up, everything's up. I know we're not supposed to probably say that right now, but uh, it's, it's not looking super great, but, um, if people don't want to come, they don't have to. And I also just like the idea that if somebody's on vacation, they can still participate. And I think after the last two years, like I can't imagine choosing to do this remotely on purpose without a good reason. Um, I also uh, like council member Zorn's point about, you know, kind of play it by ear. And, and if she's sick, you know, stay home. Like if you're sick with something and it's not COVID, you probably should stay home then too. Like, let's not get everybody else sick. Um, and and I, I, if there's anything that comes out of the last couple of years, like I, I hope that's part of it. So, um, yeah, let's uh, let's let's do this in July. All right. Well, thank you for the robust discussion on that one. Um, another potentially robust discussion item. Um, the next thing I'd like to cover is a, uh, or a focus group uh, for ARCH, which is a regional coalition for housing. So it's uh, East King County cities. We are together uh, trying to move the needle and provide more affordable housing in our region. Um, so it's no secret that uh, we, we have a need for more affordable housing. And actually over the last decade, we've been We've been losing affordable housing. I think 112,000 units 
um, of affordable housing at the 80% AMI or below uh, level have been lost. So uh, we're, we're kind of swimming upstream on this one. And for years, a lack of dedicated local revenue has reduced the potential production of affordable housing. So the ARCH executive board has been talking about this for also for years, uh, trying to figure out how to, um, how to find a dedicated revenue source, a potential dedicated revenue source. So we talked about a, a stakeholder process that we would like to start this year with the goal of having some, um, some ideas that the member cities, member jurisdictions can, can rally around to um, discuss with our legislative delegations uh, come next session. So we would like to start this process with um, focus groups comprised of elected officials from all of the jurisdictions who participate in ARCH. And so we, ARCH is seeking one to two elected officials from each jurisdiction to participate in, in this opportunity. Um, after that, it will go to other stakeholders and then a, a summit of the, the jurisdictions who are members. And then finally on to some recommendations for legislative agendas uh, later this year. So I would like to ask the council if uh, one or two of you are interested in participating um, in these focus groups with ARCH. And sadly, I don't know what type of um, time commitment it's going to be as yet, but um, certainly would circle back with whoever is interested as soon as I know. Council Member McNeil. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so Aaron, the, so you said you don't know what the time, time commitment would be, but the focus of the group, focus group would be focusing on what, what part of affordable housing? Talking about uh, proposed revenue options. So um, early engagement with the elected officials to just talk about not only options to potentially pursue, but also what some engagement would look like, um, some of the key stakeholders if uh, the elected officials have ideas. So just really wanna start the process with the elected officials so that you don't feel like you're, you're so, sort of bringing up the end of the conversation, that you are part of the early conversation as well as the end when it comes time to do some decision-making. And so when we talk about potential funding sources, are, are there going to be folks in the room that have historical backgrounds in housing? Um, or is it just gonna be elected officials talking about affordable housing. Um, I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. I, I do have yeah. a, I do have a lot of interest in this. This is something that's talked about regionally. Um, we talk about this quite often, you know, be at the SCA board meeting tomorrow. This comes up with the affordable housing task force. Um, so these conversations are happening uh, around our region often. And one of the things that um, always comes to mind for me is having the professionals in the room that, that are in the industry that understand what's going on with the industry and where, where things are moving in the direction things are moving with costs and why they're moving that direction with costs. So we talk about funding sources. Well, a funding source today could look completely different than a funding source tomorrow if those costs are going up and we're not, we're not taking care of how we're managing those cost increases. So it's, it, it, to me, it just feels like a much, much bigger conversation and understanding just the revenue source, but also understanding where we are today, where we've come from and where we're going. So I definitely would have a huge, huge interest in that being in construction for 32 years. It's a conversation that, that I'm having daily, um, even with clients today about um, houses that are becoming unaffordable for them. Uh, they were affordable two years ago when, when we set the budgets on them, but now they're unaffordable. So, um, and then understanding the differences in the types of housing as well. So I, I definitely would be, would be, interested in this. Council member Aldrichs. I would be, uh, I'd be very excited to serve alongside council member McNeil um, on that, in that focus group. Um, and, and, you know, I appreciate the, the thoughtfulness and trying to get us dates and things, but I also know that these often um, kind of ad hoc groups require a level of flexibility. And so I, I can be flexible and, and work with this, my schedule um, to, to be available for that. And if there's any, um, 
actually, can I suggest that we maybe have an alternate? So in case somebody has to pull out that we would have some, like we'd already have somebody on deck to step in for um, either of us. Is that a possibility or was that discussed amongst the ARCH members? Uh, they asked us to identify one to two elected officials from each jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. So I think if we have two of you um, at the very least, then perhaps hopefully one of you at least can attend and then um, may, maybe have some conversations up outside of that focus group if, if needed. But my hope would be is that both of you, they can find times for both of you to participate. Great. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Sounds good. All right. So it seems like we've got our two Nobody else is expressing interest. So I think we can probably close up shop with that. Um, and uh, Aaron, would you just pass on my uh, appreciation to Arch that they're going to start with the elected officials and get that policy direction before the plan gets kind of developed and baked and we get too far down the rabbit hole? Absolutely. Will do. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. I appreciate the conversation and I will pass it on to Arch. All right. Next up, we have council committee reports. Councilmember Alderks. Um, maybe uh, the city clerk can weigh in. I don't know if you received the notes from the North King County uh, homeless, Coalition on Homelessness uh, meeting that I attended, but um, I tried to get them sent out. There might've been a glitch in that. Um, and the thing that we need to be, that we need to have on our radar from there is that the, oh my goodness, the acronyms, the the King County Regional Authority on Homelessness. Nope, I got that wrong because A is at the end. Anyway, Regional Homelessness Authority. Any that one. Um, they are in the process of developing um, an interlocal agreement between North King County cities, including Bothell, that would um, kind of like Arch create a kind of payment structure so that each city would um, be invited to put in their budget, a contribution to the, the housing authority um, in order to address the homelessness crisis that is occurring in our area. So um, I asked them to sort of give staff a heads up so that they could prepare that and put that into our upcoming um, budget considerations. And they were happy to, to give us at least some guidance and direction so that that will come to us in the budget process. Um, that was kind of the biggest takeaway from that meeting. Um, but also um, the shelter, um, the enhanced shelter at the Oaks and Shoreline is still looking for an executive director. They've decided to do another round of, of applications. So if you know anybody who has experience in human services and shelter and nonprofits um, at the executive level, um, please pass it on so we can get some good leadership um, to just a fantastic program in our area. Um, I also will send, give a shout out to um, Heidi Shepard, president of the of DUSA, who received a, um, a leadership award from King County Council and Council Member Rod Dombowski um, this last week. And she's just done excellent leading, um, leading our cities and providing a space for Bothell to participate in NUSA. So that is my update on that committee to this week. All right, seeing no more hands up, I'm going to move on to visitor comment. The city has accepted visitor comment and writing as well as accepted sign-up sheets for those who wish to speak at tonight's meeting. Written comments submitted to the city clerk no later than 3 p.m. today were forwarded to all city council members and are part of the record. Um, city clerk. Uh, thank you, Mayor Thompson. Um, before I begin, I'd like to let you know that the blue sky timer, we had a little bit of overlap um, from our test one last week and the one we signed up for. And for some reason, it, it just timed us out. So um, saying that we don't have an account, which we do. So I'll have to check on that tomorrow. Um, so I'm gonna use my phone back to the, my old way and I'm gonna use my phone for the live speakers this evening. Um, but I'll begin with written comment. We got one from Andrew Nelson regarding uh, the DEI committee and asking that it be made permanent. Um, and then we have three people signed up for live. Um, speakers tonight. And the first one is Andrew Nutt. Um, Mr. Nutt, if you would, um, if you're ready, you may begin. Hello. Thank you for inviting me to share. Uh, I'm very honored 
Um, I am a proud Bothell resident and also a proud Bothell business owner. I feel very lucky and privileged to live in this beautiful community. Um, and my comments are in regard to the Bothell Way widening project that is in the, the planning phase right now. Um, and wanted to bring attention to um, uh, a couple things. Uh, the, the planning department right now is, is currently um, contemplating uh, foregoing the uh, approved development plan of five foot sidewalks and five foot bike lanes and increasing the, the footprint of them um, for the, the proposed plan. Um, for context, the Burke Gilman Trail is a 11 feet wide um, and currently in the Bothaway widening project plan, there is already 20 feet of uh, pedestrian and bike paths already allocated with a proposed potential of five to six more feet on top of that for, for like a 25, 26 foot total um, compared to the Burt Gilman of 11 feet. Um, the city development plan um, has already been approved to guide our city decision-making process and it advocates for five foot sidewalks and five foot bike lanes. Um, and I would also add that this path, this corridor won't have very many intersections. There will be a few of them with the development um, that, are, that are happening. Um, and as I, I, I'm looking, <laughs> if you can see my camera, I'm looking because my house actually and my businesses are right on Bothell Way. And this, this uh, development project will, will have a huge impact on, on my life and on my businesses and on my home. And um, I'm excited about it. Um, to, to have a better flow of traffic, but I would just want to uh, encourage the, the city council members and the city manager um, to not only stick by the development standards, but also to do everything possible to decrease the width of the project so that wetlands can be preserved um, and trauma to local landowners like myself uh, can be held to a, a minimum. Um, and uh, I just appreciate um, the, the consideration of, of um, the footprint um, and as much as the, the city council and city manager can um, weigh in on the, the planning process um, just to keep it as, as narrow um, as, as possible would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up we have Gerald Swanson. Thank Mr. you very Johnson, much. Three uh, minutes. Okay, and uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to speak to you. Um, let's see, start my video. Um, okay, I guess so. Oh, there I am. Okay, so uh, I'm here because I want to keep the topic I represent, which is the issue of the 300 and plus residents of Shag Boulevard Place and uh, their issue around the rerouting of Main Street called an interim rerouting, which probably will be at least two years, could be three, given some recent developments in the construction community. Um, and the fact that that makes uh, a very threatening situation for our movement impaired members. Now we are a, an individual or a, a, a community, we're not a, we're not a, a nursing home, but still, um, we are a community where people choose to live even if they have impediments, such as being in wheelchairs, having walkers, being on canes. And we are going to do a survey so we know the exact number, but we expect something like a third of our residents find themselves in those circumstances. They are able to live independently in that they can have some care come in uh, occasionally and help them or even daily but they can't have someone full-time helping them. So that's what it constitutes independent living these days. A um, couple of uh, recent updates. Uh, we continue to have the fire department uh, acting as if that one-way street eastbound is actually a westbound thoroughfare because that's where they come in with their uh, EMTs. And we're told, well, the fire department trumps everything. And uh, we don't mind that. They come and they actually park right in front of our entrance, which is not that area that is coned off to provide safe um, exit capability. 
Um, there was one parked out there. I actually was the one that opened the door to let them in. And they, um, as they were parked there, one of the big buses went by and there was less than a one foot clearance between the side of that bus and the EMT vehicle. Um, you know, uh, we are exploring all sorts of avenues to assist you in making a healthy decision for us. One of which is ask Metro, are you willing to reroute those buses? I just recently sent you all a, a, an email um, with the information that with just moving the um, Metro and I guess there's one sound transit route uh, two blocks north where they go east on 185th, that's already a bus route. There's already a bus stop um, along that route. And those buses could then go on their merry way as they do when they come through here. But I also included some pictures that show that that bus stop drops people in the middle of the road, not in the middle, but on the side of the road, but there's no sidewalk. There is a little bit of painting on the road, but they are also right next to the exit where the big um, concrete bus, concrete trucks and other heavy machinery exit from the construction site. Um, so I'm probably getting close to the end of my time. I just wanted to let you know that um, we want you to you know, keep, keep aware of this issue. Some of you have responded to my email and even come visited some of our situation. I appreciate that. I appreciate it's not an easy thing to make these changes, but there's 300 people here um, who choose not to take three minutes a piece for one of your meetings. That would be 900 minutes. That would be a very long meeting. Um, but instead are hoping that their voice can be heard nonetheless. Thank you. Laura, you're muted. Still muted. Sorry about that. Um, Mr. Rohrbar, you, are you ready? I'm ready. Yep, go ahead. You have three minutes. All right. Uh, Mayor Thompson, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Alcabra, uh, City Manager uh, Interim Leon Hart, and Council Members, thank you for this time. I'm Bob Rorobaugh. My address is 22724 Second Place West, right across from FEMA, living on 228. My neighbors and I noticed the increase of traffic as commuters find their way around Bothell rather than through Bothell. I represent about 13 groups that are adjacent to or close to the proposed development of the former Furling Gravel Pit. It's piled 150 feet deep. It's a toxic land uh, fill at this point, leaching both arsenic and uh, methane. A well-funded investment group from Kansas City, Missouri must have seen it from a satellite and said, ah, 26 acres, reasonably cheap. They would uh, propose in a 1300 page permit application to put in eight five-story buildings. And I want to push back uh, none of the groups or, nor their leaders, probably representing three to 5,000 people, none of them have expressed anti-development sentiment. We believe it might be a well-planned development that is out of scale for its site. I want to push back on three things. They've asked for a height variance to go five stories. And they say, and I quote, it blends in with the surrounding area. That's false. Put a pin in the middle of 26 acres and a two mile scale string and draw a circle. There's nothing within two miles like apartments or condos that are taller than two stories with the exception of embassy suites close to services, professional, dining privileges, shopping, and Canyon Park. So they're not, they're not, uh, they're not blending in with the surrounding area. Two, 
they quote, and I say the lands surrounding the site to the west and the south are presently high density. Uh, no, they're not. They're single family homes. Uh, that is false. The complex called the summit at 4th and 228th has 10 units per acre. The apartment complex up the street has 10 plus units per acre. Canyon Ridge condominiums adjacent to the site have 9.4 units per acre. Well, the Froiling fit proposal by North Point it suggests 25 units per acre. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbaugh. Your time is your time is up. Um, thank you okay. for your comments. Um, that is all I have, Mayor Thompson, on my list for this evening. Thank you, City Clerk. Um, going to move on to the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Councilmember Aldrichs. A motion to approve the consent agenda. Councilmember Zorns. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Aldrichs and a second from Councilmember Zorns to approve the consent agenda. Would anybody like to speak to the motion? All right. City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name, Councilmember Zorns. Yes. Mayor <laughs> Thompson. Yes. Councilmember Aldrichs. Yes. Councilmember McNeil. Yes. Councilmember Mankey. Yes. Deputy Mayor Alcabra. Yes. Passes six zero. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a five minute break before we get into our first agenda bill of the evening. Um, by my clock, it is seven twenty one. I will see or seven twenty two as of right now. Um, I'll see everybody back here at seven twenty seven. Recording stopped.
Um, all right, we have um, up Agenda Bill 22093, the DEI Consultant Report, Findings and Equity Plan. Um, and we have uh, Shannon Kelly Ray here to present to us. Except she's not. Um, give me oh. a minute. She's, she, we're having trouble bringing her in for some reason. So okay. hold on just a second and I get us. Recording in progress. There she comes. I hope. <laughs> there she is. Also, um, City Clerk, the on-air uh, thing is not on. I don't know if we're actually on. Oh, there it goes. Hi, Shannon. Hello. Let me Welcome. Just, thank you, thank you. Let me just pull my slide deck up so that I can share my screen with you. There we go. I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you so much, council members, and uh, thank you to the community, to the staff, for your partnership and collaboration, and really for uh, you know the city of Bothell uh, always demonstrating a very seriousness, a passion, and commitment to make sure that this community can become all that we dreamt that it could be for the people who are long-term members of Bothell's community, for people who are currently members of Bothell's community and those people that we will welcome in the future as part of Bothell's community. So I wanted to thank you all for, uh, for your partnership and, and all the hard work that you've allowed for me to do alongside you to get to the place that we are today in, in terms of our process. Um, and so with that, if you don't mind, uh, Mayor Thompson, I'll go ahead and get started. Please do. Thank you. So what I'm presenting tonight is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Assessment Summary Update. This report has been prepared uh, to present uh, to you really the findings of the organizational review or the SWOT analysis. And that is all of the, uh, a lot of policy process and procedural documents that were uh, shared with us or transferred to us by city staff, particularly uh, the city uh, manager's office and staff with the uh, awesome partnership of Becky Range and the dive -in team and many others. Um, so we did a SWOT analysis to really look at the city's uh, preparedness for uh, DEI. Uh, it is the uh, executive leadership interview insights. Those were one-on-one -on -one interviews that were conducted with members of the director's team and the city councils, uh, both former and current members. Uh, the City of Buffalo Community Listening Sessions uh, that we hosted, as well as uh, the City of Buffalo DEI Advisory Committee uh, uh, notes and recommendations, as well as uh, some best practices recommendations. So we gathered a lot of qualitative and quantitative data to help figure out exactly what it is that we're trying to solve for through a lens of uh, equity and best practices based on an international standard. And so I'll present to you both the uh, process as well as findings and then recommendations in each of those areas. Uh, also uh, includes what I believe sh uh, should be the prioritization of what you should focus on um, given limited time, uh, time resource, uh, limited time and resource and staff. So uh, the internal organizational assessment uh, provides the foundation and framing for continued data collection uh, and analysis to produce City of Buffalo diversity, equity, and inclusion road mapping, uh, smart goals, as well as uh, uh, objectives uh, for the city over the coming years. The goal of this process has been to better understand and identify measures that will really close equity gaps um, on behalf of uh, for city staff and, and even for members of the community. The organizational review analysis framework, we were supplied 13 documents by the city of Bothell in order to do a SWOT analysis. And again, based on an international standard of best practices, we looked at governance and leadership accountabilities, supply chain, programs, product, uh, programs uh, products and services, 
uh, whether or not the city was an inclusive culture and, and, and whether or not you were uh, positioned for uh, organizational sustainability in both the short term and long term. Human resources life cycle uh, relative to workforce and all those three P's that go into informing that as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion principles and strategic, strategic objectives. Does the city have a framework to both welcome, champion, and operationalize diversity, equity, and inclusion change management systemically over the long term? So when we looked at all of those documents and did that SWOT analysis, and again, this is a, an executive summary, you have, you have uh, access to, to full documents, I believe, but in terms of summary of this information, some of the early recommendations based on feedback is uh, that the city of Bothell should leverage its dive-in team, the city council, the director's team, and human resources department to really build and enable a singular message around the importance of DEI for all of the mun municipality relative to diverse workforce hiring, staff retention, and community engagement. The city of Bothell needs a supplier diversity policy and action plan with measurable goals. The city does business uh, as an organization um, and creates and really presents an incredible opportunity to support not just businesses in, uh, in the local community, but across the region with a particular emphasis uh, having uh, have, having the necessity to be placed on women-owned business and, and minority-owned business and small businesses, uh, DBE firms. Leadership, both uh, council and uh, director's team, uh, should both message and model their commitment to DEI, and it must be clearly visible at every level. There an opportunity today to build intentional advancement opportunities for both Black, uh, Indigenous, uh, people of color, or BIPOC in, in the uh, in city government roles, particularly in city leadership. What can the council do to ensure that there is diverse representation at every level of leadership, whether it be the, the, the council itself or boards and commissions or director's team or people leaders uh, in those roles to be able to advance and grow? Um, so things to consider. Incorporate a long-term and goal-oriented strategic effort to design DEI best practices into all areas of city of Bothell policies, processes, and procedures, particularly in hiring senior leadership recruitment, uh, supplier diversity, uh, uh, contracting, community planning, community outreach and engagement, and all city services. Leverage existing community partnerships and identify new external relationships to expand community reach and engagement. We heard a lot from people who are marginalized members of the community, people who are senior citizens, people who are immigrants, people who are BIPOC, uh, people who uh, don't speak English as a primary language, uh, people that are low income. We heard from lots of different people as part of this process today, and they want to know a couple things. Number one, how does government work? Number two, how can we be engaged more with government? And number three, how can government help improve the lives of all people in the community? And they wanna be a part of that, both in the short term and in the long term. So some things to think about. Folks in uh, Bothell's community want for you to focus on uh, diver representational diversity in hiring, representational diversity in voice. And we heard from a couple of folks that said, when you walk around Bothell, it feels like a really white European influenced place. Lots of folks that uh, are uh, especially Asian and Indian descent have shared that they don't see themselves in the community. They don't see themselves in the cultural celebrations. They don't see themselves in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the day to day of life. They wanna feel like the community is is framed and informed by in both the visual representation, community celebrations, and all that we think of when we think of uh, what makes up the beloved community. Directors and city council interviews, the analysis framework. So between October 2021 and February 2022, I did one-on-one -on -one interviews of uh, 60 minutes in length, some a little more, of 16 participants over Zoom video conferencing. 
the objective was to identify themes from comments and uh, and really uh, see if we can't figure out where leaders in the city believe the 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 uh, city to be in terms of DEIB diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging both in the current state and what they hoped would happen in the future. We wanted to gain a better understanding of the city of Bothell's goals, priorities, and strategies, and consider the insights and perspectives of leaders. We wanted to make sure that we were uncovering the perceived gaps and, and barriers really to a diverse workforce, a diverse workplace, and an inclusive and equitable community, um, including the workplace uh, for all people. Um, some common themes uh, in those many uh, hours of conversation, more training tools and resources are needed uh, to commit toward outreach and engagement of marginalized and underrepresented communities. Um, there needs to be a collective leadership strategy for DEI that aligns the department's efforts so that people are no longer working alone and working in silos. There has to be a singular vision and, and, and overarching strategy. Engagement of staff to learn what the critical issues are, both as an employer and service provider to the community. The city of Buffalo is a municipality, so you are a workplace, but the city of Buffalo uh, uh, exists to serve the people of the community. So thinking about the balance and alignment of that and making sure that you're engaging with staff to make sure that because they're on the front lines, they see what the need is and meet the need, consider the insight and perspective of staff as they do this work in terms of what we should prioritize and really what they see as the need. Recruitment and talent pools must be more diverse. We need more underrepresented groups to consider uh, for those open roles. The biggest roles leaders can play are to model best practices, listen to people outside of the leadership team and learn what should be done from the perspective of community members or staff. Now, again, these were comments from leaders, members of the director's team and the council. They felt that it was necessary to hear more from the community, to hear from those folks that are not frequent flyers that don't come to council all the time to listen to those voices of the disparate, to listen to the, 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 the voices of those who are who sometimes seem disinterested, but really are interested in, in the, the, the policies, processes, procedures, and programs that will impact and make better their daily lives for them and their families in the community. Uh, be proactive and not reactive. The, the majority of our leaders felt that uh, the city responded in terms of DEIB, especially after the murder of George Floyd in 2000, in a way that is reactive and not proactive. Uh, there was a call for an external review of the Bothell Police Department. Leaders are strongly committed, but need support and a plan of what they should and could be doing. Folks want to know, what should I do? How can I get some training or support so that I'll have the words and the insight to show up with the lens of DEIB in, in terms of best practice? But what should I be doing so that I might champion uh, forward, uh, uh, forward motion? DEI uh, hasn't been a real priority until now. It was shared that you're finally now doing something. There has been superficial uh, ads, We'll put around City Hall is what some folks have said. All are welcome in different languages at the door, but the insight has been we must really try to communicate and hear from people. We need personnel and budget to ensure that this effort remains in place as a high priority. Council needs to be on board. Now, those are common themes in terms of uh, quotes. All of these things have come from quotes in, in terms of themes from you folks. These were things that you said and you shared, and I synthesized because many or most of you shared these insights. Recommendations based on what you all have said, develop a communication strategy that allows for all stakeholders of the city of Bothell's community to understand the critical issues, strategies, and progress towards DEI goals. Don't let DEI be in the work that you do be the best kept secret in town. Appropriately allocate resources to support learning and the development of tools and resources to implement those best practices, both for both staff and leaders. Regularly assess the progress of those DEI uh, strategies.
Uh, she froze, and so hopefully she'll come back here in a second. Um, Oops. Uh, Oops. Training for city Oops. staff and the dive-in team members to ensure alignment pre and preparedness really to lead DEI efforts on behalf of the city and community members. Create mechanisms for regular and ongoing outreach and engagement of the community. That is not a resource that you currently have. You were able to leverage my staff to do uh, strategy and planning, to do outreach and engagement, uh, to help uh, build marketing and communication, to project manage this. So you've had the benefit of an, a full office of diversity and inclusion, including strategists, um, uh, analysts, and, and many other roles. But you know, I know that resources are tight right now for many municipalities and, and, and uh, government organizations. But uh, in order to ensure long-term sustainable success, there has to be a commitment of resources in this space. Create mechanisms, uh, again, for regular outreach and engagement. The city of Bothell must have a dependable mechanism in place. Just the same strategy this time. Here's hoping she comes back in. Yeah. I don't know, maybe she might have she may have to leave and then rejoin. I don't know. We could also see if she could call in to the Zoom. She hasn't rejoined as of yet. So as soon as she does, I'll get her panel back in. She is, I think. <laughs> The suspense is killing me. Oh, there, we there we go. It seems I was kicked out of the room. You, you froze. Okay. So there we turned it, we turned it off and turned it back on again, and we're hoping that works. Thank you. Um, uh, we have to have a dependable mechanism in place to intentionally communicate with those non-English speakers. We need to make sure that they have a way to come and participate uh, and engage. And leaders must be more accessible to those members of the community that aren't already, that they're not already regularly in contact with. That is for both directors and city council. Pay particular attention to those people from underrepresented communities, BIPOC, uh, seniors, disabled, and young people. More training, uh, tools and resources to commit toward outreach and engagement of marginalized and underrepresented communities, a collective leadership strategy for DEI, engagement of staff, recruitment uh, and talent pools, uh, bigger roles for leaders. Um, as a city, we have to take clear positions. So making sure that we do this and, and all of those things. Oh, hold on, let's see. In terms of the DEI uh, advisory committee. So we seated an advisory committee made up of uh, a very diverse uh, cross section of Bothell's community. They looked at all of these things as part of this process and provided their insights and recommendations. 
They represented 14 members of Bothell's community. We had six 90 minute sessions uh, online. We had a very robust process. And I wanted to again, thank Becky Range and city staff for making sure that we were able to uh, build this team, uh, create space to, to hear their voices and to get their insights. Um, they were really uh, brought on board to really help me and the city staff in our work to build a long-term DEI action plan for council's consideration and approval. They provided advice and counsel for the city uh, manager in terms of what will go into this overall plan. But we got to hear about their experiences, their insights and, and their uh, perceptions of both what we did helped inform what we did along this way. And then we're able to give their own recommendations based on findings and insights. So some of their early recommendations when surveying the community, allow for self-identification in as many categories as would allow for people to feel included and represented. This would include, but be not limited to sexual orientation, gender expression, racial designation, and then cultural community or nationality, as well as disability status, uh, status languages spoken at home and income level. Make sure that surveys of staff and community should be anonymous to allow for full participation, mitigating harmful impacts of negative sentiment associated with psychological safety. People want to know that if I give you my insight or opinion, I don't have to include my name and fear that someone will identify me and be upset or that I'll be punished in some way for sharing uh, some sincerely held beliefs, experiences, or their insight. Bothell City Council must work to improve their working relationship. This came from uh, that advisory body so that they may be aligned in working with and representing the community. Someone shared that they'd watched the council meeting and that it looked painful to watch it at certain times um, because of how the council engaged with one another at different times. It isn't necessary, they've said, for them to always agree, but there must be respect which allows for them to be effective on behalf of Bothell's community members and all of its stakeholders, the people that live, work, and visit or recreate in the city. The city of Bothell's DEI advisory committee they've uh, recommended should become a regular and permanent representative body of the community and meetings should be open to the public and actively engage, uh, an active uh, engagement should happen with the council, city leaders and Bothell's community. They wanna be a working uh, representative advisory committee. The group should, should, uh, the group should enter and exit service at alternating staggering intervals, allowing for the continuance of institutional knowledge. For example, some will serve 12 terms and some may serve 18. The recommendation is that you get to the point that they serve 24 because you would have two things. Number one, they would have a longer time to commit to review uh, assessment and providing advice and counsel. But number two, having it be two years means that people could regularly rotate off and provide for opportunity for more voices to come to the table to be heard and participate. Meetings of a permanent DEI advisory committee should be once per month, and DEI must be supported with ongoing funding, resources, and dedicated commitment of staff. Again, more recommendations continue. Eliminate the unfunded mandates made by city council. City of Bothell departments should have specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound or SMART goals. Leaders should be accountable for their success and, uh, and report progress toward goals to both council and the Bothell community, being transparent and accountable. City of Bothell meetings should be accessible to community members who don't speak English as a primary first language. Live meetings, transcripts, materials presented should be accessible in the most spoken and represented languages for Bothell's community. Translation services should be available for all public meetings to encourage increased participation due to, improved, uh, due to create improved accessibility. People shouldn't have to guess if a meeting is accessible to them. The DEI advisory committee should be welcomed and encouraged to make recommendations on a quarterly basis so that the city council may use it as a, a mechanism to get ongoing community feedback. There should be training provided to the DEI advisory committee, city council and city leaders to position them to lead with the DEI lens of best practices, create opportunities that would allow for city of Bothell leaders and city council members to go into the community to meet with stakeholders and reduce the reliance that community always comes to council. The DEI advisory committee should partner with city manager's office to help with community engagement. 
they felt strongly that they should be aligned with human services and connecting the community with the city council and city of Bothell leaders. And then finally, community members must be engaged regularly and in an ongoing fashion. There must be a dedicated plan, strategy, and assessment of the impact of the strategies related to community engagement goals. They want the council and all leaders and city staff to have more of a working relationship, a mutually beneficial relationship and two-way communication with the community. They want the council to, to be out in the community, roll your sleeves up and go to where the people are sometimes, communicate with the people and meet them where they are. Because city government for many still feels inaccessible. When you look at the population size of the folks that are participating in this meeting, people feel like the best way for people to know who you are, what you're doing and what you prioritize is to go out and, and, and meet them where they are. Do nothing for them without them. Build nothing for them without them. Best practices recommendations, communicate the significance and value out of DEI for Bothell, share findings highlighted both, uh, highlighting both strengths and opportunities and align both internal and external messaging regarding DEI. Investment, adequately resource DEI strategies impacting the workforce, workplace, and the community. Understanding, increase efforts to educate, engage, and empower leaders and staff on how to best advance, support, and incorporate DEI best practices into action. Accountability, hold all Bothell uh, employees accountable for advancing DEI. Leaders must be responsible for measurable success toward DEI goals. And then support, dig deeper into the experiences of underrepresented groups, particularly women and racial minorities. Ensure that an equity plan is in place with desired outcomes and performance measures. Now, what does that mean when we get into the weeds a little bit? Some of those recommendations uh, in terms of communication, publicly share key highlights from the assessment, both strengths and weaknesses, celebrate key strengths and clearly communicate the benefits to staff, community members and, and stakeholders of what you're trying to accomplish with DEI. What I've seen in, in terms of benchmarking in the region, people are hostile to the words diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. People can be hostile to the words affirmative action and social justice because they aren't sure of what those terms mean. They don't understand that the goal of these policies is to open access and, and to increase accessibility to improve outcomes for all people, not just some. People are confused and they think that it means that we have to take privilege enjoyed by the few historically to give it to folks who've not enjoyed privilege and to, to bring harm to the folks who've enjoyed privilege historically. And that's not the goal. The goal is to create systemic change to improve the opportunities for everyone, improve outcomes for everyone. Highlight core strengths of inclusion and belonging on Bothell's career page to support the employee value proposition. Emphasize the city of Bothell's roadmap to address opportunities across each department. This should not be something that we build as a plan that will gather dust and no one's responsible. Every director should have a DEI strategy across their department with very specific measurable goals that they and their teams are responsible to champion and, and, and bring in the resources required to do that. In terms of investment, embed reminders of Bothell's leadership commitment as a key driver of DEI for the city of Bothell's goals and outcomes. Reinforce self-reported individual accountability and the perceptions of directors and the city manager's commitment to a fair and inclusive work environment in regular DEI communications, particularly with those uh, that will have a call, uh, call to action for Bothell's uh, city staff. Embed DEI strategy across each city of Bothell department and establish measurable SMART goals and hold leaders responsible for, for advocating, championing, and accomplishing success for those goals. And to do that, you have to ensure appropriate funding to support the year-over-year -year success of DEI strategic goals and objectives. We cannot have unfunded mandates. 
We have to make sure that if we have a goal and we set a strategy that you have to position the city manager's office and the many departments and teams and staff and stakeholders, you have to give them the time, the staff and the resource to be able to accomplish those goals. Understanding, conduct expansive talent searches with the goal of recruiting across industries that would complement Bothell's search for best of the best in industries that have transferable skills. Look beyond those candidates with public sector backgrounds. Look for transferable skills. Cast a wider net and bring in talent. Leverage the superpowers in the community, both here and beyond. Establish a comprehensive leadership program to better support and position succession planning for emerging leaders across the city of Bothell for roles and possibly even city council. Identify women, veteran, and racial minority serving professional organizations for partnership opportunities, providing top of funnel talent sourcing. Build, execute, and regularly assess a management or leadership program that's accessible for staff at all levels in creating development, uh, professional development opportunities. Regular and ongoing DEI curriculum and best practices embedded into relevant training and learning programs. Don't let people have that one training that they do and they retire from the city 20 or 30 years later, and they talk about that one training that they did or that learning opportunity that they had 20 or 30 years ago. Make sure that if it's important that we embed it, it becomes part of the culture and part of the conversation that we have regularly. In terms of accountability, ensure appropriate staffing levels to communicate, scale and support DEI goals and strategies. Identify both internal and external opportunities to champion DEI through targeted investment, partnership, collabor uh, partnership co uh, collaboration, and, and, uh, and collaboration. Review an annual DEI strategy and goal document, ensure appropriate funding levels for successful execution of desired outcomes, and regularly review and assess DEI initiatives for their impact. Do strategies and assess them for effectiveness. Make sure that what we are endeavoring to do, we are getting the desired results. So regularly assess. And then finally, in terms of support, conduct focus groups among demographic uh, groups across all factors, particularly paying close attention to those folks who have the lowest factored sentiment scores. Probe into the biggest areas of concern for the city right now, that's having a voice in equity. And, and professional opportunities. Address psychological safety so that all City of Bothell staff and community members feel that they can share concerns openly with their peers, managers, directors, and council members without fear of retribution. Establish DEI competencies for both leaders and individual contributors. Build this into performance reviews and hold everyone accountable for growth and efforts toward objectives and key results. The dive-in team should be supported in development, funding, and execution of their own uh, uh, annual goals that align with the City of Bothell's workplace, workforce, and community goals. Right now, they are all that you have. They are your ch early champions. They are your, your uh, skin in the game. They are making sure that these conversations happen, that work moves forward. I know that they're championing uh, the raising of the, the a flag for Juneteenth, but it's, it's examples like that, but many other things that they do in order to do outreach engagement across the city staff and the community. And then finally, coaching, sponsorship, mentorship, and professional development opportunities that should be designed to support both leaders and individual contributors so that they feel that they have the tools and information necessary Mayor Thompson, I can end her and uh, <coughs> bring her back. Meeting and hope that she comes back. I'd say at this point, that's probably the thing to do. I 
think we were nearing the end of the presentation. So while she's trying to dial her back in, um, I can probably entertain some questions or initial thoughts that you might have. Um, I know that was a lot of information. So yeah, if you just have any thoughts, um, by all means. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, uh, Becky and Shannon, through Becky, for uh, a great presentation. <laughs> um, hopefully Shannon will can join us here soon. There was a next, uh, well, there, I have a couple of questions about the documents we received and then questions about next steps. Number one, we did not receive the SWOT analysis that was mentioned earlier. Okay. Is that something we're supposed to receive uh, a um, longer document or? Yeah, I'm not sure, but we can definitely follow up on that and make sure you have all the full details. And as far as the next steps slide, that is, uh, that were, Shannon, I guess that was next on her, uh, in her talk, uh, is that, are those other presentations that we're going to have, uh, or is there more documents that will, will be sent? Because uh, that's present at the end. Says presentation of plan to Bothell City Council date TBD. And that was like the yeah. step apparently. Yeah. So I know there's a few more things that are going to be happening before she finalizes the plan and presents that to you. I don't have the slides up in front of me, but I believe uh, there's going to be some department one-on-one -on -one and interviews. Mm -hmm or maybe individually with the departments. Um, I think there is a staff survey that's been drafted, but hasn't actually been sent out yet. Um, I know we did do a staff survey, but it's been a good while. And so I think Shannon and her team were kind of reviewing that information, but preparing a more updated staff survey, uh, which we think okay. is pretty important. And then I think uh, there'll be a little bit more work done on the, the actual action plan, and then that will come back to you. And I'll have to get with her to find out exactly when. But I, I believe this information will be done to help you in your budget development process. For oh, this year. Okay, perfect. Because that was going to be, yeah. thank you for the segue, you read my mind, because that was going to be <laughs> next. Uh, if it was possible to get concrete, you know, from best practices or yeah. estimates, budget estimates and resource requirements, all mm -hmm. that, which I'm assuming that you're preparing for our when we have our budget discussions. Yes, But it's absolutely. very important to put our money where uh, our mouths are. So Absolutely. appreciate it. Thank you. So that will come in the budget. So, so yes. I, okay, cool. Thank you. Council member Alderks. Thank you, mayor. I, I do have additional questions for uh, Chana when she can return I, and I hope she can return. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just want to first start by acknowledging that um, our community embarked on really difficult conversations um that uh that hit home like literally you know in our it's very much a visceral um kind of response that um people who have experienced oppression will experience when they're talking about some of these issues um and so i am just very grateful to a community who stepped up for the dei advisory committee i'm grateful for a council that voted uh to conduct this um, this study, I'm grateful for Shannon and her staff for everything that they have done to, uh, you know, tell us these hard things that we need to hear and, um, and provide us a roadmap for how we can do better going forward. Um, so I just will, you know, save some of my questions. I appreciate, uh, the deputy mayor's questions as well. Um, I share many of them and, um, and yeah, just, this is, this is the important work of being a leader. This is what it looks like to, um, to really hear and listen and understand the um, experiences of the people that we share our community with. And so I'm, I'm grateful that we are, we are doing this work. Glad to be doing it together. Thank you. And if I could just comment on the DEI Public Advisory Committee, it is an amazing, wonderful group. And so we formed that committee, you know, and wanted to give them some special time with Janin to really talk you know, about city topics that, you know, and kind of be feel free to do that. Uh, but we would also like to continue to have that committee seated until the end of the year to work with our staff and the dive in team and to get a little bit more, um, you know, comfortable with them and engage with them. And, you know, the dive in team's already asked if they can meet and engage more with the public advisory committee, which is, that's a wonderful thing for the different folks on that committee to help educate staff on what they need and what the groups that they represent need for us to do better service. So we're really excited about that. Councilmember Zorns. 
Um, I have uh, a, cu a couple observations, and I think, Becky, you could probably field these questions um, if we can't get Shannon back. Um, and, and a lot of points resonated with me. I'm, I'm not going to spit them back out because I think it probably resonated with everyone else, and we don't need to hear, you know, Jean's version of, of, of uh, what we have already heard. Um, but, uh, I, I did appreciate if I understood her comment that there are phrases like DEI and social justice that can be words that mean different things to different people. And, and I think that's true, not just in this context, but in other contexts that we can say something and our terminology can be, uh, uh, we, we can have different definitions for things. And so I appreciate the challenge to talk concepts um, because I think we can become more purposeful and thoughtful speakers if we take time to think of synonyms that better express our intent and our ideas and being cognizant that sometimes we think we're saying that we're talking about the same thing mm -hmm. and we may be totally not hearing and miscommunicating with each other. Um, and and creating unnecessary hardship, which is is not helpful at all. Um, also, I wanted to say um, the the uh, uh, fear is a huge issue. I think the first time I ran across it here in Bothell hmm, could be even close to fifteen years ago when the apartments had a higher next to us had a higher density of. Um, Mexican and Central American um, Latin uh, folks living, that whole population's been, you know, moved out because of uh, the cost of rent. But I remember going and knocking on doors to talk with people and that, that fear was a real thing of what is it um, and am I putting myself at risk to create an opinion, you know, to have an opinion on something? So I, I recognize that that's a, that, that is a real thing and often probably earned and, uh, it's worth genuinely making those fears go away. So here's my one solitary question, and then I'm going to yield the floor. Uh, Shannon or Becky, do you, for DEI, what department do you think it will be um, mostly housed in? I, I know our goal is to be integrated within all departments, but to me it seems like this D, DEI conversation that we're having has a very strong overlap with HR. Am I misinterpreting that? I'll, I'll, I'll one, go ahead, Becky. Well, no, Shannon, I'd like to hear your input. Um, I do, okay. it does have a strong overlap with HR, but we do also think that um, the DE office and program might should reside in the executive office because it's just really needs to be elevated in importance and um, be given the, you know, the priority that it needs. But I don't know, Shannon, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I'll tell you, I've done this work in many places and I've watched the successes and failures of where they seek this position. And people who are subject matter experts in this space uh, that I occupy will nearly uniformly say that HR is not the place where this role should, should be done. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, this, uh, you know, this is a role that is very neat and should a director level role that should be its own office or department. And it is also part of the part of an organization uh, that touches every part of the organization. Mm -hmm. And someone in this role is brought in essentially to, to change what has been, you know, the, the, the casual usual order. You're asking someone that come to come in to, to project manage and champion really the the institution in the way that it's always existed. Mm -hmm. So someone that comes in to create systemic institutional organizational change management where they will do that work with HR, with parks, with public works, with human services, with police, with fire and rescue to couch it. And I've watched it happen. Hide inside of HR means that you will often have a chief HR officer, director of HR and HR leader 
that will decide what will be prioritized and what won't. Mm -hmm. I've watched watch people uh, languish um, and, and, and not be empowered. But if an organization feels like this is an important uh, role, that it's a, a value add for the city, but if you believe that it's one of your priorities, that person has to have a direct line of communication with the city manager, a, a city's mayor, and with council and leaders to be able to offer without fear of retribution their uh, honest and professional insights, opinions, and offer recommendations. It sounds. It sounds like, and cor correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like if you're if the goal, if if you put it within the executive leadership team, it, it almost is guaranteed to have a seat not only at that table but at every table that's set in Bothell. Mm -hmm. Is am I understanding that correctly? That is correct, and okay. you know. It, look, look, look around at, at other municipalities. If this becomes a manager level position or lower, if this is someone that cannot control the work that they do or conversations or spaces that they have, those are people that will never stay in those roles. Mm, good point. Okay. Thank you, Shannon. I just appreciate you so much. Um, and I don't want to turn this into Shannon appreciation hour. Well, a little bit I do, but I really do appreciate the work that you and Becky and the dive in team and our DEI community has done. And um, it's been a it's been a group think a great group think project. I really appreciate how you've uh, clarified all all the things that um, were on your hearts and minds and brought it to council. So my thanks to everyone. Thank you. Um, in terms of prioritization, I would say this. The first thing you have to do is make sure that you adequately fund this work. Make sure that there is a plan in place and we'll build that plan, but to resource that plan and make sure that you hold folks accountable. If you don't measure something, it doesn't really matter. And then finally, make sure that you are accessible. You know, we, we do things in government or any organization because that's how we've always done it. And it's comfortable and it's easy and it's efficient. But when you have a community that is growing in the diversity that Bothell is, you cannot have someone that speaks American Sign Language. I mean, there's a reason that when there is a time of, of, of crisis in the great state of Washington and Governor Inslee speaking, that there's someone alongside him speaking in American Sign Language mm -hmm. because it's critically, critically important that all of the community knows. Right. You also find that people are translating in other languages and then there's a relay system because it's critically important that people participate in government in those times. But it can't be the times of crisis. It has to be in the times of everyday communication and conversation because someone wants to know that they can come to a meeting tonight and say, Deputy Mayor, uh, I want to know, you know, what, it, what, what, it, what matters to you and what are the city's priorities and how can I be engaged? People want to be able to have those conversations. So I would say that, you know, in terms of top three, resource the work, make sure that you have a plan in place and hold folks accountable. And, and make sure that you're building these things for the community, with the community, with staff, uh, uh, with, with community members, with businesses, with everyone, partner, um, for the things that the city can't be resourced to do because you can't boil the ocean all at one time. Make sure, wait, maybe that's not a good analogy for, for our <laughs> for eco-friendly uh, ideas, but, but if you want to feed a lot of birds with one seed, you'll do that because you've partnered leverage the superpowers that exist in the community. My, my question for all of you tonight, because you know I take notes at every opportunity I can. I have two questions for you, for all of the council members, if you could engage in conversations for me. I wanna know what are the council's priorities for DEI over the course of the next two or three years? You all have to have in your mind things that you're thinking about right now that if all the stars align, you wanna see some things come to life. What are some of those things that are priorities for each of you individually or all of you collectively? And then finally, what commitments, if any, are you willing to champion to advance the long-term sustainability uh, of the city's DEI goals that are really designed for systemic growth and long-term sustainable change? What are you all willing to commit to do in order to make sure that this work lives 
because I don't want to see this happen that we have a conversation three years from now when people say, we got a new council. Remember the other council used to talk about DEI? We don't do that anymore. What happened to that stuff? What are your priorities and what are you willing to do to make sure that we have long-term sustainable success? And I'd love to hear from any of you. Councilmember McNeil. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Shannon, for the uh, the assessment um, update. Um, you know, when you come here, um, I get pretty emotional because um, these conversations are not just conversations that have happened in the last few years for me. They've been happening in my entire life. And um, to hear how far we've come as a community and the conversations as Council Member Aldrich's alluded to, the tough conversations that we've had in the last couple of years, um, say that we're making progress, but we have a long way to go. Uh, and we're just starting that road right now. We're just starting on that journey. Um, and there's something that you say that always resonates with me, and that's don't do something for me without me. And I think that's, I think that message itself, those words mean so much to me because I think it, it, for me, it's a matter of listening and learning from everybody at the lens they look at life through. And I may look at it a little differently than you do because of where I come from or the deputy mayor or the mayor or other council members or city staff. It's important for me as a leader um, and what, what I want to set out to do is ensure that I listen and I learn and I give everybody the opportunity to have their voices heard. Um, so that's, that's my commitment is to ensure that I continue to do that. And when I see others that are not doing that, um, to raise my voice, raise my hand and say, hey, let's stop for a minute, minute and take a pause and let's just listen and ensure that we're, we're learning from each other. And hopefully that'll, that'll to me, hopefully that'll, that'll set the tone for paving the way to continue to become better um, for not just um, us here, but uh, locally, but regionally as well as, and as a country and a society. Council member Aldrichs. Janet, I'm so glad you could join us again. We were, we were lost without you. <laughs> Um, and we, we tried to carry on, um, uh, but thank you for those questions. Um, I think to answer the first one as directly as I can is um, I very much know how complicated um, this process is and because the city is a big organization um, and there are a lot of moving parts to it. And so really what I was looking for throughout this process was that roadmap that you're talking about and some clear guidance um, in terms of, of you know, here's, here's some options that we can choose from as a, as a community. Um, just, just really being able to connect us from this step of, of diving deeply, learning, understanding um, into, okay, but now, do, now what? What do we do with it? Um, and so I know that that is going to be um, an important next step so that's really what, so like, I don't know if your question is like, exactly, you know, what do you want from this process? Like maybe, maybe the question is more long-term, where do I want to see us in 30, 40 years from now? And, and I could, I don't know if that was what you're asking, but I do hope that we are laying the groundwork for that, that time frame, right? So that we have a generational change that is lasting and that is real. And that we are seeing, you know, I'm looking at metrics, like are, are we able to increase home ownership from people who are historically impoverished? Are we able to um, create, you know, are we able to reduce and eliminate disparities in policing and um, improve, um, improve diversity on our staff? Uh, are we able to see representation on in our in our city leadership on our boards and commissions that match our community um, you know are we able to get metrics of people reporting you know safety and belonging in our community right like those are like I both want the numbers but I also want the feeling too I want people to feel safe and and to be able to help shift 
those who've reported to you that they didn't necessarily feel safe in our community to, you know, to figure out how do we address their needs and how do we help them um, move into a, a more, you know, embraced position in their, in our community. So the, I don't know if I'm answering your question. I'm trying to you did. both you be did. practical, but also long-term at the same time. Yeah. So thank you. You did. I wanted to know what are the things that, that you feel uh, are important? What, what things, uh, whether they're missing or not, what are those things that, that you want to champion that you see as a necessary to move forward? And then, but the other part of my question was, what are you as a council member willing to champion and, and try and bring others along on, on council? What are you willing to commit to or what are you willing to do to make sure that we can get those things that you envision? I mean, the city doesn't have a human services department. Your group of advisors said we need a human services department. Staff have said we need a human services department and aligning human services with our DEI efforts as part of a strong and robust outreach and engagement process. But what is this, what is the council willing to do to, to champion that and to make sure that it happens for example? Thank you. Council Member Zorns. Well, I feel like this is a very thoughtful essay question, and I'm going to miss a major part of it of what Shannon's looking for. So um, I'm I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you what's on has been on my heart and continues to be on my heart, and hopefully that will um, uh, get what you're an answer of what you're looking for. I don't like it when there's vilification of people. And it happens on this council, it happens on our streets, it happens, it happens in as we're going down the street, just driving down the street, where we make an assumption and we and we and we think those people are an inconvenience, what it, for whatever reason. And so I really bristle at uh, vilification, however minor it may seem. Um, so that is one piece as a city as we function that I that I hope that we can um, uh, 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 I don't know if we, we can totally purge out, but I would like us to be able to minimize its impact. And then my and then a sense of community and neighborhoods is really important to me here in Bothell. So that I think the DEI piece is really important on helping people that are within their communities, they know that how they can come alongside of each other and um, be, be a, larger, a, a larger group that they can rely and encourage and be available to each other um, because of our DE policies, DEI policies and, and other policies that we've made that are thoughtful. It's really important to me that people are heard. Um, we have some isms that signal that we've listened to somebody and they know that they haven't been listened to. They've been patted on the head so they can, so they, they'll move on their way and we can get onto our own business. I want to um, be very careful about the isms that we use around. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. And then the other piece is that I want to be, and this is where a DEI filter is very helpful, is I don't want code and policy inadvertently pitting people against each other. Um, so when we make new po uh, code and policy as a city, we're thinking about, um, does this help us work as a city or are we going to accidentally you know, inadvertently, because we don't have all the information, pit people against each other, and th and that's something that uh, that uh, is a constant, constant concern of me for me is what we do and the impact of it. Is it going to accident? Because I don't think we have malicious people for the most part here in Bothell, but we're not omniscient. And I am afraid that the, those unintended consequences, I'm, a, I'm afraid of those unintended consequences. Does, am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. And I, I hear that often. And 
generally it's born of it's it's generally born of people who have gotten used to the way that things are and then when we have to cast a wider net or build a bigger tent to welcome all of those in uh, out of the rain and out of the storm into a safe place people are fearful that that they won't have room because they've been in the tent and enjoyed that warmth and comfort for so long. And they're worried that we bring other people into the tent. But what I know for sure in the long relationship that I've had with the city of Bothell as a member of Bothell's community is I've watched Bothell grow over 20 years and Bothell has shown itself to be resilient and, and able to build a bigger tent to accommodate everybody. And when you offer freedom and access and opportunity to some, it doesn't mean that you're taking it from others because Microsoft wasn't as big as it was at one point, but look at where they are when they welcomed all of those voices and, 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 and experiences and, and opportunity. And Amazon has come a long way from people driving around to deliver books and CDs and DVDs. So it's possible. People are afraid of, of the unknown and what they don't know. And they're afraid that when you provide access and opportunity for, for the many, that it would diminish what it's always represented for the few. But we can't let that, that idea stop us. There's people today that are threatened by that, that we find loading weapons in vans to, because they're challenged with, with what they consider not typical love. We see people challenged and, and saying that, that they're going to be replaced in terms of leaders and in terms of, of positioning and power, but we can't let that deter us. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and uh, thank you, Ch Shannon. I went first when you had just dropped, so uh, I'm glad you're back so I can thank you in person. Thank you. Uh, at least here virtually. And I look forward to the next steps, uh, first of all, because uh, I feel like there's going to be a lot of good information in here to help us. Because one of the questions I asked of uh, Becky is, uh, like, what's next? You know, like, we're going to go through this. We'll, we'll be provide a roadmap. There'll be, you'll probably come back and present to us. But then that needs to go into our budget. Because uh, I 100% agree, we do need to commit uh, and I did say, put our money where our mouths are. So uh, we do need to commit. Uh, what are the best practices? You suggested maybe having an eight, uh, DEI department that reports directly to the, uh, uh, perhaps the city manager. I mean, it's a organization-wide department. Um, if that's what your recommendation is and senior leadership agrees, then that's it. We're not gonna, uh, I personally will not, I'm not going to interfere with how the organization is structured. Uh, I will be glad to sign the check as long as, or at least approve signing the check as long as it's uh, reasonable. Hopefully go through our budget process. We have that set as a high priority uh, because I, I believe I came in here because I'm part of the community who has never been reached out you know, the American Muslim community, nobody reaches out to the American Muslim community. So, and that's just one community, you know, so we need to have more outreach to those communities that don't historically, don't, don't feel comfortable reaching out to government entities, you know, uh, because uh, we build a lot of things that affect them, so, uh, all those communities, and we need, do need to have positive outreach. And I understand it requires resources and all that stuff. So that's why I feel it's very important to get the funding, which happens here in the next, few months we're going to go through that process and I would love to establish the DEI department including the necessary staffing and funding for that department and I'd love to continue the DEI advisory committee uh, community uh, DEI advisory committee I guess because we do need to have those voices uh, and the cadence and, and, and rotations and all that maybe there'll be a set of bylaws or rules that will that define those um, and finally, I hope that we still have an HR department because you mentioned there isn't one. And it's like, I think Matt is the HR director. And, and I oh, no, that human services. Is, uh, human services, yeah. But here, I thought we do have a human service. Oh, human services. Oh, my fault. I read that human resources. It's like, man, <laughs> I like Matt. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's cool. My fault. So human services department, if that's the way we're going to do because 
you are right, the AI is more than just the AI, you know, it's also about the, it's not about, you know, uh, race and ethnicities and religion and all that. It's about, you know, social, uh, fi you know, where are they, financial status and all that kind of stuff. I don't know what the right terminology is, but you get what I'm saying. Economic, uh, where they sit economically, I guess. So uh, I, I um, did that answer your questions? It does. Thank you. All right, if you haven't, oh, Councilmember Mankey. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Shannon, for uh, the presentation. Um, there's a long list of items, and um, I'm really looking forward to getting the full uh, final report and presentation to help us really prioritize those, the most critical things um, that you think we should focus on. But just thinking through uh, personally what I what I'm excited about, um, one quick win we have, um, we've already agreed to this, is we're going to have a study session on looking at our boards and commissions. And DEI is something that was brought up in that discussion is something we want to look at making permanent. I think um, I haven't polled council, but pretty sure we're all in agreement to we want to make that permanent. So that is coming and I'm excited about that. Um, hearing from the community is very important as well, as Council Member McNeil said. So I would really, really like to see more community outreach and engagement, um, hearing from those voices that we don't normally hear from. Having a staff member that is dedicated to that would be incredibly valuable as a council member. And um, I would expect that that staff member to help connect us into the community as well for those face-to-face -face going to where they are, um, having those conversations and then helping us build those relationships with community members that we have not reached yet. So I am 100% behind that and hope to see that um, in our budget this coming year. There's, a, I think there's a lot more we could talk about. I wanna keep it, keep it fairly short, but I also wanna say as an HR professional, I agree with you that um, a DEI role does not belong under HR. I love our HR team. I think very highly of them, but I, I very well know that sometimes HR is where things go to die. And this cannot die. This needs to live in a place where it receives proper respect and attention. And I think the executive department is probably a good place for that. Um, more discussion, I think, can be had around that. But fully support this going outside of HR as much as I as much as I love Matt and his team and think that they do excellent work. So, just wanted to say thank you for making that recommendation. Um, something I was thinking about in the back of my head, but I'm glad I'm glad you brought it forward and uh, put it out there for us. Thank you, Councilman Mankey. And I, I, I don't just love Matt. I adore Matt. He's great. He is a champion in this space. And, you know, one of the first people that cornered me when I came on board to, to do this project. And I don't know that there is, are many folks that have a stronger voice and a, a very strong, desperate desire for this work to be successful. But you're right. HR is where DEI goes to die. I think, I think one of the reasons why that is, is, it takes the responsibility off of everybody in the organization and they look at it as an HR thing, HR initiative, and they're not responsible. So I, yeah. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's, that's typically what I've seen in the past and it, it disengages other members of, um, of leadership and of, of the organization. Yeah, you're right. All right, I think that's everybody. That means it's my turn now. Um, Shannon, thank you so much. Um, I uh, would just say that like, we absolutely know that we're gonna need to approve budget dollars and, and that tracks, right? You show me your budget, I'll show you what you value. And um, I am just, I'm hoping that in the kind of final form um, that we're gonna get a recommendation of like, here is the position or the positions that are needed. Here is what they do. Here is what it looks like. Kind of that roadmap to move forward. Um, cool. I'm going to just stop saying that sentence because I see you nodding. Yeah. You probably don't need to hear me go down that road anymore. Awesome. That's that's really what I'm looking forward to. Um, really because, and I'm going to answer question number two first. Um, the what commitments are you willing to champion around long-term sustainable change? Um, 
I love the way you phrased it, just saying what happens in three years from now when a future council. It's like, hey, remember when we talked about that? I can't really think of anything more appealing in this role than making change that outlasts you and and making sustainable, systemic, long-term change that isn't something that can be just rapidly undone by somebody with a different ideology. Um, yeah, I want to champion that. Um, that's that's super important um, in, in this space and in others. Um, and your first question was, what are council's priorities over the next two years? And I, I guess this is along that same sense is to embed DEI in the decision-making culture, um, both from a like hiring staff perspective, a community engagement perspective, and also just a planning perspective, kind of the, the boring everyday decisions that we make on a random Tuesday. I want to take this into account on those because that's the work and that's where it happens. Um, so um, yeah, recommendations. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing kind of what that looks like in terms of best practices and kind of what, what the final form of this looks like. Um, does that adequately answer your question? It does. Perfect. It does. Well, thank you so much for your work. Thank you for coming to present to us. Um, and we're, we're excited to see you the next time. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And please accept my most humble apology. I've never had, uh, you know, these kind of technical challenges, but I'll say at least you have my voice and, and not the sound. I don't sound like a cat for the whole conversation. So. Could be worse. Uh, you know, uh, nobody's good at Zoom yet and it doesn't work great for anybody. And it's just sort of what we're doing now. But I, I think the next time you come, um, we'll, we'll get to see you in three dimensions, which will be even nicer. There you go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have council conversations. And we'll see you next week. Oh, council member Zorns. Um, I'll try to be fast. Uh, Juneteenth flag raising is Thursday. Thank you, James, that you're going to be doing that. I'm in the classroom, so I can't be there, but thank you for doing that. Um, and uh, I just wanted to kind of let you guys know a, co a conversation because I think we're all we're all concerned about our pop shops succeeding. And I was in a conversation with some Main Street folks and they suggested signs on the back side because um, people don't necessarily know what our pop shops are there, what they're there for. They just don't. And someone suggested that the city think about putting um, cute signs on the backside that lets people who are approaching them from a different direction know what's there. Um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. But the other problem, this kind of gets back to what Rami was trying to address at the beginning of the year was lot E, F, and G from what I hear from the uh, pop shop people is that they really don't have parking because construction is parked there during their business hours. And um, it kind of feels like, you know, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free um, parking situation there. And I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll put an agenda item request out and see if anybody wants to sign on it. Um, of maybe coming up with some ideas that are low, low key of, uh, you know, how to manage the parking there on EF and G and uh, do it in a way that will help the pop shops thrive. So I just wanted to tell you what's on my mind on there. And um, maybe some, some of you have some other ideas on EF and G that, where it's not going to be a huge commitment, but you know, we're not giving away free parking for people who aren't shopping in Bothell. I have a little bias there. So anyway, your thoughts. Oh, and everybody, we all want to say thank you to Aaron, right? Are we going to save our big thank yous for when Kyle's here at the end of the month? 
probably. You can never say say thank you enough. It's not like she's not going to be here. I know. I know. But I've grown accustomed to her face. But anyway, parking, E, F, and G. We got to figure it out. Parking is one thing which might uh, increase uh, the idea I was proposing. I mean, we took it as, and the picture I presented was a food truck, you know, area, but it's the idea is to create some act, action in that area that's outside of just people parking there all day or all night. That will not only, that will definitely benefit the pop up trucks because now you have a churn in people just walking around and enjoying that area, but also will, will have better, for, uh, uh, will be better for Main Street. Um, you know, we can go back again and have, start charging, you know, we can do a private, public, private, some go with a private company that manages parking lots and say, put up a booth and just charge people, you know, as soon as when they get in. So that's, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that thought came across my mind. Do you think that that's economically someone would do that, you know, step in and do that? I, I don't Well, somebody has to do the, the, the financial analysis. Right. I, don't know, I don't know. But I mean, it could be a, that I'm, I'm solutioning at a high right. level. The devil is in the details, obviously, right. as we learned. Right. And um, it could be as simple as that as just to, to charge, or it could be an honor system. You have a box and people. <laughs> Which you know you can put a box. You know people for the most for the most part are honest. You know because we still pay parking. You have some, every once in a while. Maybe we'll talk to Chief Super like and say, like, "Hey, every once in a while, have a squad car just drive by." You know, and just it. do a presence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or something, you know, uh, right. Well, I, I will have to be high touch. But, well, you know. I will tell you honor system, and then and then I'm gonna let Jenny talk. Um, uh, I've been subbing a lot at Bothell High School and those darlings, I mean, I adore those kids, but I I like to eavesdrop and I'm just going to put it out there because I'm kind of, you know, snitching on them. They'll go, we can speed down the street because nobody will stop us because the police can't stop us. And I said to them one time, I said, well, you know, wait till the uh cameras go in then you won't need police officers and that stopped them cold so so uh any rate if we could do something like that with the parking where you know it looks like we mean business that would be great council member aldrix i'm just so used to zoom and raising hands i realize this is a conversation but i it's so hard to, it's so easy to kind of talk over each other. Um, so I still wait my turn and raise my hand, <laughs> whatever. Um, so I would really not like to see the city take this on as something that we, that we are like hiring for. Um, I do think that there are companies that, you know, that's like literally their gig that they, they manage parking lots. Um, and this would be sort of a contract, uh, we could contract it out and that might be a better proposal. Um, I absolutely agree that, you know, when given the choice between, hey, would you like to pay for parking each month when you don't have to pay for parking right now? The answer is going to be like, no, we don't want to pay for parking. So we'll just keep it the way it is. And and it, it really is up to us as, as, you know, leaders of the city to say like, look, you're going to have to pay for parking. And then it's just figuring out how to do that. Um, and if that's all we do right now, I would be disappointed. Um, but it still is, it's at least part of the transition from, you know, free parking to a usable space and figuring out a a good use for that space. So, um, I would, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to turn it into paid parking, I would look into, you know, companies that we could contract with and then see what the financials are on it and, um, and what kind of, you know, how much of that goes to the city and not just to the, um, to the company that is, would be responsible for maintaining the parking lot. Those are my thoughts on that. Council member Mankey. After we got the email about the the news that it wouldn't be rented out. Um, I asked a couple more questions and found out that 
there wasn't a negotiation process that took place after we kind of gave the the figure we would like to see and the construction company kind of gave what they were willing to pay for. So I've asked that we go back and talk to them a little bit more and see if we can come to some kind of agreement in the middle. I don't know how long that will take, but um, there was acknowledgement that we can go and do that. So that's uh, something hopefully we'll hear in the future, but I, I have no idea chances of success of an agreement or anything like that. But I do think it would be worthwhile trying to figure out what else we could do with the lot. If we're not going to do food trucks, maybe there's another alternative that we can do um, that's not as, as expensive, but still provides some kind of value uh, to the community or, I don't know, some kind of revenue generation. So I'd like to look at that more. I don't know if we need to set up a subcommittee to kind of work through that, you know, together as a council with staff, or if there's a committee that exists already that could take that on, but would definitely like to see us look at that a little bit more if we can't come to an agreement with the construction company. I mean, we have a uh, dog park across the street. We can do, do, do make it a family outing. You have a pump track across the street and a dog park on the other side. You have, you know, you can split the family. Some people do bikes and skateboards or whatever. The other side goes dog. And then you have the, you can go down, you know, go to Baskin Robbins. You can go up, you know, across the street. I mean, you can do so many things, make it a really nice family gathering instead of just a, uh, a boring parking lot, you know, as it is today. And it's not, it won't be, um, hopefully won't interfere too much in the cleanup process. I haven't seen, there's probably probes in the ground and all that stuff, but I haven't seen much activity other than just cars parked there all day. So to make it more useful. What do you think, uh, Mayor, about the pump track? I mean, I, I think that it's something you can do with volunteers and dirt and they'll take really good care of it. And there's volunteers in the area that work with the city of Kirkland right now on a park that they have. And um, I think it would be a, a really simple way to activate the space that wouldn't require uh, ongoing effort from our overstressed parks department. Um, and we could turn it into a space that has some value over the next couple of years. And if, um, I mean, I, I don't remember who it was that said, you know, why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free? If all we're going to do is say, hey, do you want to pay money for this thing that we're giving you for free right now? They're going to say, no. I mean, that's what I would say. So, and I mean, there's the park and ride down the street that um, is still usually pretty empty. And if the construction workers have to walk an extra couple blocks, they'll still go to work and it'll still be okay. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested in activating that space um, in a more permanent way method than just using it to store cars that could be stored elsewhere. I mean, heck, we can put some turf and we can make it a lacrosse training for the youth. Ooh. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so, so, so <laughs> question. For the ribbon cutting. Ribbon cutting coming soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so question, does someone want to help me fashion an agenda bill pr proposal so that we can... Um, talk about it and vote on whether, you know, and ask staff to help us out with it. For What's the next step? What's the next step on this? In other words, does anybody want to do a next step on this? As a parking lot? You mean a paid parking lot? Is that yeah, or, or something else? Or just ask staff to come back with three proposals you know, because they have all sorts of free time. Um, ben, yeah. made, ben, made, ben made a great, great, uh, he made two good points. One is wait and see if, you know, the construction company wants to negotiate. Um, so I guess that would have priority. Um, and then the other was put a, you know, put a group together to do some brainstorming. Um, but um, I would like to get moving on this and and do something with that lot so I, I i don't what do you guys think what do what's the next step on doing getting something moving on that lot i mean i think the pump track idea is like it just needs dirt and there's already some of that there and volunteers will keep it up um because there's not a lot of spaces for those especially right in the middle of a downtown like that would be something that would be super attractive to the community that that does that kind of work um and I mean, I, I happen to know people that are doing that work with the city of Kirkland right now. We can talk to the city of Kirkland, see how that works for them, see how much staff time that takes. Um, but I, I mean, I think it would say something pretty cool about our priorities as a city. 
if as you come into the city, instead of having, you know, a bunch of cars with weeds up on the side of them, that you've got a place where kids can play like, and I would like that very much. I just also add to that mayor that uh, not everybody has had the opportunity to experience the joy of the pump track. And so you would be doing some uh, evangelizing for, for that as a form of recreation and just, um, you know, providing opportunities for kids and families to experience something new and fun together. And that's just always good to broaden your horizons and experience new things. Uh, so Jean, to answer your question, do you want to start drafting that the document, the proposal document with those two or three options we talked about? And then like, I can sign as a, like yeah. you have your primary sponsor. I can be the secondary and we need one. Okay. I, yeah, I would, I would be more than happy to have another brain mm -hmm. help noodle, you know, noodle how to do uh, this. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I guess, you know, to Ben's point, maybe we ought to see if the construction company wants to come back as we're mm -hmm. talking here, I'm thinking, maybe that's the first priority to see if the construction company is going to negotiate something. And then the other piece is, do does someone need to make a call to Paul to see whether or not we can do a pump track? You know, what are the things that would raise the, you know, the city city's eyebrows on the legal end? I, what I'm saying is maybe we need to get a little more information, but um, mm -hmm. after that, yeah, let's put an agenda bill together. And if you want to help, yay, I would love it. I mean, I can, it's not that hard, so we can do it. No, <laughs> no, no. But I just want to make sure that we don't, that I don't, you know, yeah, no, get I the bit you. in my mouth and, and run over something that um, needs you know, some thought if, first. If there's anything that I have utter confidence in is that if we say something that Paul has a concern about, he will let us know. Yes. <laughs> yes. Can okay. I take a lime scooter on a pump track? That work? Ooh, I mean, that sounds fun. <laughs> that sounds. That actually sounds fun. I'm not sure I say that. No, don't give anybody any ideas. The liability might come back on you. In all seriousness, though, I'm curious. Um, pump tracks. How do they fare in the winter time? If there's rain, um, do they become unmanageable? Are they a summer only thing, or is this a year round sport? Oh, no, it's a, I mean, it's a year round sport. I mean, they exist in many in a few different forms. They can be dirt. They can also be there's concrete pump tracks. You know, Leavenworth actually hosted pump track worlds, brought a ton of money into the local economy for a pump track they built a few years ago. Um, and I mean, it's not going to be as good in the winter, but a lot of it depends on how it's built and what kind of dirt, what kind of drainage, that sort of thing. But it's it's not going to be as good in the wintertime, um, but it's still generally usable i mean heck when the weather is nice we can have a pump track pump track when the weather is not nice we can have a park paid parking lot i mean it's yeah. like you know it's a win-win for this like it's being used for something useful you know we're putting the dog park up when the when the weather gets nice and we take it down in the winter and uh, or you know which starts in august <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was just curious. I was just curious if it was something we could we could utilize all year, or if we'd have to change like change of use for the the area. Because I know that that takes more staff time or volunteer time, and can ha come with extra costs as well. So just like to think, you know, kind of year round, it's going to be a two year probably um, opportunity. So it's good to know at the there, outset. The one of the things people will do is they'll, you know, have plastic and they'll just put plastic over it when nobody's riding on it. And then when they come and ride, they pull the plastic off, ride, pull the plastic back on. We can, we can consider as a discussion because the process is it will go to, uh, we'll come up with this agenda proposal. It will go in, staff will go do some quick, you know, research or uh, whatever. And then, that it will be inserted in some future agenda, which is probably what September, October is going to be in the time frame. Um, yeah, so that's how it's going to be. By then, maybe it'll be too late for a contract, but we might want to have some other options in there. All right. Well, Deputy Mayor Alcabra and Council Member Zorns have some homework. And want to join in the fun since you know, 
Sure, happy to. We just did the informal committee right here, but everybody's okay with it. Are we supposed to say ad hoc? Isn't that the fancy? Ad hoc, ad hoc. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'll also say we are almost a month away, a month and a day away from our first uh, Friday night event. And that is super exciting. I agree. All right. We seem to be slowing down. Everybody have a good one. Thank you for all of your time, staff, everybody that's still here. Thank you for sticking around. Um, and we'll see y'all not next week, but in two weeks. Good night. Night. Everyone.